Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Ven. Thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, attending this uh, workshop uh, as a part of Canadian Phytopathological Society's workshop series. And this workshop is a result of, uh, uh, in part, uh, the special issue that uh, Nico, myself, and uh, a few of our other uh, rust pathologist colleagues uh, published um, in last year. Uh, so we were uh, uh, we were asked by the Canadian Phytopathological Society if uh, we should arrange a workshop, and we thought it's a good idea. And we have uh, uh, an exciting uh, list of uh, six speakers in this workshop today. Two of the speakers are from forest uh, or tree rust pathology um, 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 a section, and uh, four of the speakers are from crop rust pathology section. Uh, we are recording this meeting, but if uh, any of the speakers is not comfortable or due to some other reason uh, they can't, uh, uh, you know, let us record their talk and share it with the attendees. Please, please let us know, and we will make sure we won't share your presentation or your talk uh, with the attendees. Uh, with that, uh, I think we are good to start. Uh, we we will have a break after the first three talks for twenty minutes, and then we will resume the meeting. Uh, so you can go grab coffee in that, those 20 minutes or you can also stay on Zoom and you can chat with your colleagues, you know. So, uh, Nico, did I miss anything? You want to say a few words? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think you're good. I can uh, introduce the first speaker. Uh, sure. I think we have about seven minutes and we are not very many attendees. Maybe we can uh, uh, have a, a quick round of uh, introductions with uh, everyone. Um, I think that shouldn't take very long. So I will start with myself. I'm Gurcharan Brar. I'm an assistant professor in Faculty of Land and Food Systems at UBC Vancouver. My research program mostly is focused on wheat and barley, genetics, pathology, pre-breeding. Nico? Yeah, uh, so I'm uh, Nicolas Faux. I'm a research scientist at uh, Natural Resource Canada, uh, Canadian Forest Service in uh, Victoria, in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, and uh, I think that's it for me. <laughs> Pascal, if you want to go yes. ahead. So I'm Pascal Frey. I am a researcher at INRAE in France. INRAE is a French National Institute for Research for Agriculture, Food and the Environment. And I am a forest pathologist, uh, mostly interested in uh, epidemiology and population genetics of forest pathogens and mostly um, forest rust. Uh, and I will talk about poplar rust. Guillermo, maybe you can go next. Yeah, yeah, Guillaume, uh, Guillaume Biodo. I'm a research scientist at the Citizen Food Inspection Agency in Ottawa, here in Canada. Ferdisa? Yeah, and Ferdis, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ferdisa Bokore. I'm uh, based at the uh, Swift Current uh, Research and Development Center, um, FC Canada. So my research is on uh, focusing on wheat trusts and Restaurants, breeding, and germplasm development, and that kind of stuff. Thank you. When? When will you mute? Sorry. Hi, my name is Wen Chen. I'm a research scientist at the Ottawa Research Center of Agriculture and Agri Food Canada. Um, my lab focused on genome, uh, genomics and metagenomics based phytomicrobiome research. Thank you. Uh, Richard, you are, you are, I think everybody knows you, right? <laughs> no, maybe not, maybe not. So I'm Richard Amelin, I'm at uh, UBC, I'm a professor in forest pathology and uh, I work on uh, Rust fungi and um, did my PhD actually on poplar rust, the fungus that uh, Pascal is going to tell us about. And I've uh, made several uh, uh, trips to uh, visit uh, Pascal and in Nancy, very, very great memories. Uh, and also, uh, uh, now that I'm uh, <clears throat> on the West Coast, I uh, 
uh, I work uh, mostly on pine rust, the Cronarsham group. Seren? Hello, can you hear me? I had a, yes. a yeah, sound problem. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Soren Seifi. I am lead plant pathologist at Aurora Cannabis Company here in Comox Valley. We have a dedicated research facility working on uh, breeding for um, different aspects of, of, of cannabis plant. My projects are mainly focused on um, resistant breeding for powdery mildew uh, in cannabis. And I'd like to thank for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Mason. Mm. Mason, can you hear us? Hi. Should I introduce myself? Yes, please. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, my name is Mazen. I'm the critical breeder at the Field Crop Development Center here in Lacombe. That's we are now we are part of the Olds College. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Chuck. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Chuck Cheng, uh, project uh, uh, lead at the PMC uh, Pesticide Management Center in Ottawa. I'm a plant pathologist. I got my PhD at the, the plant science at McGill University. So currently I work on uh, minor use and pesticide regulation. Thank you. And Giron, Gironzi, please pardon me uh, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Oh, that's good. Hi, I'm Jeremy Gironzi. I'm working the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and I'm the team of the plant health risk assessment in the pathology group. Emma? Hi, um, my name is Emma. I'm a master's student at the University of Victoria in the forest biology department, and I'm looking mostly at Swiss needle cast. Uh, next one is FCDC's iPhone. I don't know, is it Sajid? Hi, sorry, it's Sasha Waterman. I'm the pathology technician at FCDC Olds College um, in the barley breeding program. Thank you, uh, Joel. Joel, are you there with us? Right, so we can move on to the next one. Stephen? Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on where you're from. Uh, my name is Stefan Zeglin. I'm the Provincial Forest Health Officer for the province of British Columbia. In a previous life, I used to be a forest pathologist with the same ministry working in the coast area. And I'll be talking about one of my projects from that era. Thank you. Brian. Oh, hello folks. Um, I'm Brian and I work with, uh, with Richard and I uh, study uh, white pine blister rust. Maddie. Hi, I'm Mary Gwen Miltenberg. Um, I'm a risk assessor in the pathology group um, at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Michael. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Tesfandres. I work for the New Brunswick Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries. I'm a plant pathologist with the department. Uh, Lily. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hello, Risha and Liko. <laughs> I work on with we shared before. And uh, now <clears throat> I'm an instructor at uh, Quantum Polytechnic University. I teach plant pathology. <laughs> Leah. Hi, uh, I'm Leah. I'm a master's student at UBC Charles Lab. I work with Pine Rust. And Devon. I'm a computational biologist with ASC working with Wen Chen um, on her variety of projects mainly looking at um, plant microbiomes and soil microbiomes, including uh, aero microbiomes and rust. Thank you. Fandora, 
gonna leave. Hello everyone. My name is Yanevis Gonzalez Pena from Dora. I'm a PhD student at the University of Lethbridge. I'm working at AFC. And I'm working on plant pathogen interaction, mostly with Fusarium and MAP kinases. Uh, Andre? Oh, I'm uh, Andre Laroche, and I'm a research scientist with AFC in Lethbridge. Uh, Shimosh? Hi, I am uh, Shimush Correra. I am from uh, uh, University of Manitoba. I'm a master's student. I am working on uh, developing a rapid method to identify fungi responsible for FHP and frost diseases using a uh, matrix assisted laser desorption time of flight mass spectrometry. Thank you. Uh, Sigun? Sigun, are you there? Um, then we can move on to next one. Tilaka. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tilaka Kasharaj. I am um, I am a project lead at uh, AAFC's uh, Pest Management Center, Ottawa. So I think uh, uh, I have met Ben Chen quite a few times. I don't know if she remembers me. And my colleague Chuck Chen is here. Uh, so we at the Pest Management Center do a variety of projects on pathology. We both work in the pathology team. So currently I have a project in um, Yellow Rest. So I thought it would be interesting to gain more understanding on you know, like participating and then gaining some uh, knowledge on this one. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. Samia. Hi, Samia here. I work at 2020 Seed Lab as a disease diagnostician. Excited to learn about rust today. Thank you. Um, Daniel. You're, uh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel, we can't hear you. No. Do you mind uh, writing your introduction in chat for us? keeping uh, in time um, that we might be a little late. Sorry, Daniel, we will have to move on, but if you don't mind writing your introduction in chat, that will be helpful. Ron? Good morning, um, I'm Ron Knox. I'm a research scientist at uh, AFC and Swift Current. Uh, I work on marker development and application of markers to breeding. Thank you, Ron. Michael Holt. Uh, yeah, I'm Michael. I'm a research associate with uh, Olds College Field Crop Development Center. Uh, Kim. Oh, yay. No picture. Um, I'm Kim Canward, and I'm actually the R&D manager with 2020 Seed Labs, and I'm here tag teaming with uh, Sami and Joel. Thank you. Uh, Melissa? Okay, I think we have everybody's introduction. If I missed someone, please feel free to introduce yourself with the, that Andy's uh, writing a few sentences about yourself in the chat. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for uh, um, being here. So I think without any further delay, we will start with our very first talk from uh, Dr. Pascal Frey. Uh, he will talk about popular rust. Uh, Pascal, I guess you already have... Uh, um, you can already share your screen, right? Are you host or co-host? Um, I'm not authorized to share my screen, apparently. Uh, 
You but should uh, give me the authorization to share my screen. Who is, uh, who is uh, a webinar CPS host? I think it's me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You should. Yes. Now it's working. You should be good, okay. Pascal. Okay. Uh, just one thing, Pascal. Thank you for yes. accepting to be up so late. It's late. No, 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 it's, it's okay. It's it, it's six p.m. It's a. Uh, it's six p.m. I, I just I, I just went back from 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 work and I'm at home. So, but it's not a, uh, it's not unusual hours. So it's uh, it's perfect. And I will uh, I will stay for the whole uh, workshop uh, until nine p.m. In, in, in French hours. So it, because I want to to listen to the others also. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And. Um, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, especially you, especially you, Nicola and uh, Gershan, for inviting me for this uh, for this workshop. And um, I will show you that uh, poplar rust is not very different from wheat rust and other crop rust. So I, um, my title is uh, "Poplar rust never sleeps," and I will talk about emergence of a new genetic group of Melanopsora larici populina, the poplar. The poplar rust fungus following um, a poplar major resistant gene breakdown and um, so i'm at um, at the department of tree microbe interactions at inrae which is a joint um, research department with inrae and university de lorraine and um, just <laughs> a word about the title rust never sleeps it's a famous uh, sentence uh, written by Norman Borlaug uh, that uh, I think all of you know, the famous plant pathologist and wheat breeder and father of the Green Revolution and who was a Nobel P Peace Prize laureate. And uh, it has nothing to do with, uh, with the album of uh, Neil Young <laughs> called also Never, Rust Never Sleeps. So a few words about pot plant cultivation in Europe. So in Europe and in most part of the world, uh, we um, use mostly Euro-American hybrids, uh, uh, which are hybrids of uh, Populus nigra, which is uh, comes from Eurasia, and Populus deltoides from North America, and also inter-American hybrids, uh, hybrids between two North American species. Uh, the problem is that uh, usually there is a low number of cultivars that are planted uh, up to five or to 10 per region. And uh, it's of course monoclonal and even aged plantations like uh, on the picture here. And um, most of poplar are planted as large spacing plantations and it's used uh, like uh, on this picture for peeling uh, to, to make veneer and packaging, but also for sewing particle boards and pulp uh, for paper. But there are also a little bit of short rotation copies uh, that are used for biomass and bioenergy. And France is the first poplar wood producer in the European Union and the second worldwide after China. And it produces uh, around uh, 2 million cubic meters of wood per year, which is almost the same amount as uh, oak or beech for comparison. And the problem of poplar cultivation is that it's very um, damaged by poplar rust uh, caused by several species of the genus Melanopsora. Um, so it's, it's a fungus that belongs to the Basidio mycotina and the order Puccinialis. And uh, poplar rust is the main disease of, of commercial poplar cultivation worldwide. And it causes um, perturbation of photosynthesis and early defoliation, as you can see on the left of the picture. Um, and of course, if there is early defoliation, it, it leads to reduction of biomass. And uh, we have measured that it can uh, lead, lead to high yield losses uh, as, uh, as much as uh, 30 to 60% of yield losses annually. And of course, uh, of, um, uh, after one year, uh, it also, the, the next year, it also um, um, creates a perturbation of autumnal translocation in, in autumn. And this leads to susceptibility to secondary parasites that can lead to death of young trees. Poplar rust doesn't kill trees, but it, it, it makes them um, more uh, susceptible to other uh, insect pests or uh, other uh, secondary diseases that, that can lead to death. And of course, um, 
there have been um, breeding strategies for resistance to poplar rust uh, for almost during the, all the 20th century. And um, the, the first strategy was selection uh, of qualitative resistance, uh, which is based on, on, on major resistant genes. And it was used at least since uh, 1950 by poplar breeders uh, all around the world, in, in, in France, uh, Italy, uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, for instance. The problem is that uh, such uh, qualitative resistance are based on monogenic and dominant um, genes. And it's, so it's easier to select for the breeder, but it's also um, easy to overcome by the fungus, which, has, uh, which makes uh, sexual reproduction and uh, can mm -hmm. easily, easily um, uh, break down uh, such resistances. And so it, it's, a, it's a big issue of sustainability of resistance, especially for a perennial crop. Of course, it's not wheat or an annual crop that we can change uh, the cultivar uh, year by year. But if you plant poplar, you have to, to keep it for at least 15, uh, 15 or 20 years. So this strategy has failed and has led to serious epidemics. And uh, so since uh, at least 20 years or more, 30 years, um, breeders have turned to quantitative resistances. Um, and th this was the case, for instance, for my colleagues, uh, poplar breeders in, uh, in, High, in Orléans. The first cultivars were only, were only commercial, commercially released in um, 2012. So it takes uh, almost uh, 20 years to to, to release uh, commercial uh, cultivars. Um, such uh, quantitative resistances are based on polygenic resistance, which are QTL based. And of course, it's more difficult to select uh, for the breeders, but it's also supposed to be more difficult to be overcome by the pathogen. So it should be more durable. So I will give a few examples of breakdown of qualitative resistance genes uh, because there have been a lot during the 20th century. In 1986, there was a breakdown of RMLP2 uh, gene, which was um, born um, in several Italian cultivars, namely Luisa Avanzo, which was largely planted in Italy and in southwestern France. And it, it led to, to major epidemics. In 1994, there was a, a major breakdown of um, the RMLP7 gene, which was born by Beaupré, a Belgian cultivar, and, and other Belgian and, and Dutch cultivars that were largely planted over um, um, large territories in, in, in the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and so on. And I will talk about this. Uh, during most of my talk. And, and in 1997, there was also a breakdown of RMLP8, which was born also by a German, um, a Belgian cultivar. And this happened um, one year before its um, commercial release. So the, the cultivar was, was almost not planted. And of course, the poplar, poplar rust interactions um, follows the gene for gene relationship. And we have a uh, kind of red queen dynamics with um, um, a race between uh, the breeders that try to find new resistances uh, uh, all the time. And of course, the rust that uh, is able to, to overcome those resistance. And to date, all the 130 cultivars available in the European Union are overcome. There is no more um, totally resistant poplar cultivar. And here you have on the bottom, uh, you have maps of France with the, which shows the dispersal of virulent seven isolates after the breakdown of the RMLP7 resistance. And so the red um, um, department, it's, uh, like countries, I would say, um, regions uh, are, are, are colonized by those uh, new strains after it's the breakdown after the, the first appearance in 1994 um, in, um, in Belgium and Northern France. And then um, they spread all over the country very quickly. 
This slide is just to remind you that uh, this rust, poplar rust, especially the species Melampsora larisi populina, has a um, uh, typical um, complicated life cycle, uh, heteroecious microcyclic uh, life cycle, with the poplar as a telial host on which there is a clonal multiplication from spring to autumn with um, a lot of um, asexual multiplication rounds uh, from poplar leaf to poplar leaf. And then uh, in spring, you have a sexual reproduction phase, which occurs on the asial host, which in this case is large, um, uh, which explains the name Larici popina. Larici comes from Larix, uh, Latin name of large. And this is, um, almost uh, obligatory, even if there are some uh, asexual lineages that, uh, that don't uh, perform sexual reproduction. Uh, one important point is, is that the uredinospores, those which attack poplars, of course, are dicaryotic, so they are diploid on the genetic, from a genetic point of view. So now I will talk about the um, evolutionary consequences of the RMLP7 resistance breakdown. So you find again the, the, those maps of, of France with the um, spread of those uh, new isolates. And um, um, uh, Antoine Persons, uh, um, who was a, a former PhD student in our lab, he sampled um, in our historical collection um, of poplar rust that we keep alive in, 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 in ultra freezers in our lab. Um, he sampled 600, 600 isolates and analyzed them with uh, 25 microsatellite markers. And here is the result as um, um, a structure uh, um, graph um, uh, which shows. Um, the, the grouping, the gathering of, of populations of isolates in, 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 in genetic groups. And so um, we can find on, at the bottom there are the, um, I should use um, perhaps the pen. Do, do you see when I move the, the, the pen here? Oui. Um, on the bottom, you have the years of collection. And at the beginning, we had this um, blue colored uh, genetic group, which we, we, which we call the fossil group. Um, and in fact, it, it vanishes after uh, 1998. And uh, from um, 1994, we have this uh, um, uh, breakdown of uh, the, this, our MLP7 gene, and, and this coincides with the uh, apparition of uh, new strains, um, which belong to this red colored group, which we call the cultivated group. And most of the strains belonging to this genetic group are um, phenotypically virulent seven, of course. And this group uh, totally replaced the blue group. That's why we call the blue group a fossil group, because it's at it has totally disappeared. So the population of poplar rust has been totally replaced. And the replacement um, time was about four years because the, the, the new group appeared in 94 and, and the blue group disappeared in 98. And in green, you have another group, which is a wild group uh, that was sampled in the Alps uh, where we can find very relictual um, populations, which are mostly avian seven and which are not uh, influenced by poplar cultivation. And in a, in, during his postdoc, uh, Antoine Persons selected um, about 80 isolates uh, belonging to, to the three groups. So the fossil group, the cultivated group at the beginning in 94, the cultivated group four years later uh, in 98, and then the wild group. And those um, almost uh, 80 um, isolates were a whole genome sequenced with Illumina uh, to do some uh, population genomics analysis. And that's what it did. And here you have uh, some uh, graphs uh, focused on the on a par, uh, on a portion of chromosome 15 in the genome of the rest. And he did the genome scan uh, looking for signature of selective sweeps. So there are different indices that were used. Um, and he, using these, these indices, he found two regions that were um, susceptible to have um, uh, selective, uh, to have been, um, have signature of selective sweeps. 
And then um, during um, her PhD thesis, Agathe Maupetit uh, did um, GWAS, so genome-wide um, association study, um, comparing virulent seven uh, versus avirulent seven individuals, uh, that uh, the, the same individuals that were whole genome sequenced. And uh, she found uh, quite easily a region on chromosome 15 also, um, with a very strong signal of uh, of um, association between the phenotype virulent versus avirulent and, um, and, and, and the genotypes, uh, the SNPs uh, found on this chromosome. So this, this led to the identification of a candidate lotus for uh, AVR, AVR MLP7 um, gene. And if we put um, this uh, locus on, on, the, on the previous slide, it, it, it's, it doesn't, um, um, correspond exactly to the two regions that were identified previously, but it's almost at the same, on, in the same region of chromosome 15. So it was validated by the genome scan approach. And then looking um, deeper into those um, three um, SNPs uh, found on chromosome 15, um, Agathe Maupetit uh, uh, and um, Antoine Persons um, found that uh, there was one gene, uh, then one coding region with one gene and two um, SNPs were not um, interesting, filling into an, an intron and in a um, UTR region. And one uh, SNP was really interesting because it was a non-synonymous um, uh, SNP, uh, changing a serine to glycine in the in the coding uh, region of the protein, and so this 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 is a um, uh, very interesting uh, non-synonymous uh, SNP in the avirulence gene. And furthermore, uh, Clement, Clementine Louet during her PhD. Um, uh, looked further into this uh, region, um, uh, flanking the avirulence um, candidate gene, and she found out that uh, there was also a partial or complete deletion. So we had some isolates with two gene copies. So this is um, sequencing depth in this region. And then there were some isolates with only one gene copy. So you have a drop of uh, sequencing depth in this region and also isolates with totally no gene copy and, and a total deletion of all the region. Uh, the, the red uh, rectangle corresponding to the gene in which we have the non-synonyms. So in fact, we have two types of mutations at the same locus, one SNP, one non-synonymous SNP in the gene, in the coding region, and one deletion that encompass the, this gene. And then uh, this leads to six different genotypes at the candidate uh, locus. So for the avirulent uh, phenotype, we have of course a wild type uh, avirulent phenotype with two copies of the avirulent allele. Uh, and those two genotypes with one only one copy of the avirulent allele, which is enough to be recognized by the resistant gene uh, of the plant, of course, of poplar, and leads to avirulent phenotype, so no disease. And for the virulent phenotype, when disease is present, there is no copy of the avirulent allele, and there are either both uh, copies of, of the mutated allele, little a vir, or uh, two copies of the deleted alleles, or a combination of deletion plus uh, mutated allele. So there are six different genotypes, theoretically. And finally, she found out that Pascal is frozen. Yeah, I think it's on his side. I'm going to wait a few seconds. Pascal, uh, oh, I think he may have to rejoin.
Uh, Nico, can you try to contact Pascal? Yeah, it's what I'm doing right now, actually. In the meantime, I will uh, request uh, attendees that if you have any question, uh, you can either use raise hand function or you can type your question in the chat. Sorry, and I had, uh... Or myself will uh, pose that question to. We are good, Gershon. Yeah. Pascal is back. So, yes, I'm back. I had a, sorry, I had an um, internet failure at home. So I hope it will, won't uh, happen again. So I go back to my. Uh, slideshow do you see it now yeah all good thank you pascal okay um so so there is a very good um, correlation between um, genotype and phenotype and a few exceptions in red here one and here four other which for which either the genotype should be uh, virulent and finally the phenotype is virulent or the opposite um, the um, genotype uh, is is virulent and and and, and the, the the strain is virulent so we have 98 percent of individual which are consistent with the gene for gene relationship so we think that it's at least a partial validation of the virulence candidate gene um, and then we, we studied since um, um, the sampling was a temporal sampling over uh, almost 30 years in our historical collection of poplar rust that has been uh, gathered at the beginning by Jean Pinot, my, my former colleague who began collecting poplar rust and, and keeping it alive in, in liquid nitrogen. Um, so here you have uh, from 1990, to 2016, um, the evolution of the, um, of the um, allele frequency, uh, here is uh, the color code uh, with the three alleles. Um, and of course, in the fossil group, we have a majority of uh, um, avalent allele, but nevertheless, we have already, even uh, four years before the breakdown of the resistant gene, we have already red and black, that means avalent and deleted alleles, uh, virulent, virulent and deleted alleles that were already present, but of course at heterozygous state. It was not homozygous uh, strains, otherwise the, the, the resistant genes would have been uh, broken down earlier. So this is very interesting, a very surprising finding. That is that uh, before 1994, so before the breakdown, we had already both alleles, but unfortunately we, we could not go back earlier because we, we, we had no, oops, sorry. We, we could not go back earlier. We, we had no uh, living strains uh, um, uh, from earlier period. And then uh, after, uh, fr from the breakdown and, and after, um, in the cultivated group, we have, of course, a, a great majority of uh, um, virulent uh, alleles. And we can see um, a shift with an increase of the deleted allele um, compared to the um, mutated uh, avalanche gene. And perhaps this deleted allele um, confer a better fitness to the strains. Okay, and then um, what is in this gene? So the, this evidence gene is an orphan gene with no known homologue. It, it has a um, 219 uh, amino acid sequence with uh, seven cysteine residues. It's expressed, we find it in rna -Sec. It has a non-classical secretion pathway. It has not a signal peptide. It's, uh, but secretome P um, predict uh, um, 
that it's secreted somehow. So it's rich in cysteine residues. There is no homologue in other puccinals except uh, Melanchthon Larissi Botulina. It has no, uh, no known functional domain. And uh, the environment of the gene is rich in transposable elements. And then in a second part of her thesis, um, Clementine Louet uh, tried to find the um, um, subcellular localization of the, um, of the effector. So she used uh, gene fusions with uh, m cherry um, um, fluor fluorochrome. And um, uh, she found out that um, the um, the candidate uh, evidence effector uh, accumulates in chloroplasts here, here in red uh, compared to GFP, which accumulates in the nucleus. And here you have the chloroplast. And uh, here also in the chloroplast compared with, uh, with the fusion CTP1, which is addressed to the chloroplast and the mitochondria with GFP. So it, which gives uh, a dual color of uh, in the chloroplast, but only only green one in the mit mitochondria. Okay, and to 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 finish, um, I will just mention that many other rust effectors are, are also addressed to the chloroplast. So here you have a, a, a scheme of a, a plant cell with many um, um, effectors that has been have been characterized in Melanchthon laris pulina, but also in flax rust in. Um, wheat stem rust, in wheat um, stripe rust, and in the soybean rust. And uh, so all the, um, the, the effectors were, 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 were placed in different um, organelles in the nucleus or in the chloroplast. And there are other uh, rust uh, effectors that are addressed to the chloroplast. But the actual role of uh, AVR MLP7 is still to be discovered. So then I would like to acknowledge um, my many colleagues that took part uh, somehow in, the, in this long story. Uh, so especially Sébastien Duplessis, our head of the department, Fabien Halquette, uh, Stéphane Demita, and um, especially Antoine Persons, Agathe Mopetit, and Clémentine Louet, who, who took the main part in, the, in this work. And to finish, I would just uh, advertise a, a PhD position uh, in our team about uh, evolutionary and functional studies of uh, reproductive mode uh, polymorphism in, the, in this fungus, in the popularus fungus. And so if you are interested, it will be supervised by Fabien, uh, myself, and Sebastian. And you, you can contact me um, uh, in, the, in the next weeks uh, if, if, you are, if there are some master students that uh, would like to come to our beautiful uh, INRAI campus in Lorraine in France. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. I think uh, it's going to be a really exciting position given the story that you just delivered today. Um, we, uh, I see already there's a question from Soren. Maybe we're going to go with two questions because we are already running late. And uh, there will be an opportunity for more questions during the 20 minute break that we will have later. So maybe Soren, you can go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, Pascal, it was a very interesting story. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is related to the situation when we have in, we, we, you, you uh, presented that the avirulent protein of the pathogen still was, uh, the plant was able to detect that and you had an incompatible interaction. Was wondering if, since the virulent protein is accumulated in the chloroplast, in the incompatible interaction, where was the location of that of, um, um, where you're dealing with a typical NR all dose enriched receptor cytoplasmic mm -hmm. one, or the, the location was in chloroplast as well? Thank yes. you. Yes, yes, very interesting question. Um, we didn't study the, um, the localization, the subcellular localization of the, of the everance allele, but Usually, in uh, in uh, gene for gene relationship, especially with rust, the the effector that is recognized, so the wild type aberrant allele, is uh, recognized very early um, at the time of the formation of the first hostoria in in, in the plant uh, tissues. So the rust fungus, uh, the the germ tube penet penetrates through the stomata, and um, uh, 
liberates some um, so, so, some proteins, uh, including those effectors, and, and and some effectors are recognized if, if the the plant genotype is resistant, has the, the corresponding resistant genes, so the NLR. Uh, so, but on the plant side, we we know somehow where the locus is located. And Sebastian, but there are at least uh, 10 or so um, NLR, NLR aims is to, to take one by one all these 10 NLR and, and to check the interactions. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, there's a question in the chat. No, you can come back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat. Are you planning from uh, Mazen? Are you planning to use yeast to H system to yeah. identify interactions? Yes, ex 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 yes, exactly. That's the, 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 the following of the previous question. Uh, uh, yes, we, we, one idea, but it was uh, we could not uh, do it during the PhD thesis of uh, Clementine, but that the next step is to take um, those um, resistant genes one by one and to try to identify wh which one is the RMLP7 gene. And we would use uh, yeast to hybrid uh, um, techniques for interacting uh, the, the plant protein and, and the, the the fungal protein. One difficulty is the production of, um, I didn't talk about it, but uh, Clementine also tried to produce uh, the, the protein in, in vitro, in, in Escherichia coli, and, and it's quite uh, difficult to produce and to purify. She, she had a lot. Okay. <laughs> I think we are losing Pascal again. Uh, so maybe we can move on so, with um, the... the protein, the, the fungal protein. The pro for, um... Pascal, we lose you a little bit. We didn't hear the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, the internet is cutting a bit. Yeah. Um, maybe we should move with the next presenter, with uh, Stéphane Ziegler from the BC Ministry of Forest. And uh, we're going to go in uh, silvicultural practices. So there's different way to, uh, to manage uh, uh, tree rust, uh, so breeding for resistance, uh, but also uh, silvicultural uh, pra practices. And this is a big thing in forestry. And Stefan going to give us a little uh, flavor about that, this kind of practices with the white pine, the infamous white pine blister rust, uh, Cronarchium uh, ribicola was uh, devastated. Uh, five needle pines, uh, white pine in uh, North uh, America. So, Stefan, uh, I think the, the room is yours. Thank you, Nico. Mm -hmm. Hello again, everyone. Uh, just before I start, I'd like to uh, have a warning for this presentation. Um, absolutely no genomics will be talked about during this presentation. So, no qPCRs were hurt in the uh, conducting of this trial and the subsequent reporting. So all the people that are genomic keeners like Richard, you can take a nap for the next 20 minutes and you won't miss anything. Your, your world will remain intact by the end of it. Okay, so as Nico alluded to uh, white pine blister rust caused by Carnarshrum ribicola is a large problem in forestry in British Columbia and other places in North America, and particularly in Western North America. So this is uh, an amalgamation of a few studies that were done to test effective silvicultural techniques to try to control mortality caused by blister rust. And the photo illustrates the uh, the end result of successfully infected trees, uh, these are Western white pine. The green ones are still alive. The non-green ones have succumbed to white pine blister rust uh, in a most spectacular fashion. So the problem as stated is the 
The causal agent, Cronosium ribicola, is an introduced pathogen into North America. And subsequently, the hosts, which are all five needle pines in North America, uh, including Western white pine, which is the subject of this talk, but also including other five needle pines like Eastern white pine, uh, white bark pine, limber pine, Southwestern white pine, all the other ones are all susceptible to this disease. And it has done a tremendous number on the native population of these white pines. In the case of Western white pine on the coast of Western North America, about 90% of the natural population succumbed over the last century after the introduction of the fungus into Western North America. The situation is also similar for Eastern white pine, although generally speaking, Eastern white pine doesn't suffer as much as Western white pine does. So even though a lot of the early work that was done on managing this disease was done with Eastern white pine, the, uh, the information is not necessarily quite transferable um, nor is it always applicable to the Western situation. So a little bit about the biology. I'm sure most of you know how these rusts work, the heteraceous macrocyclic rusts of which Pascal gave another example of one in his talk. Um, Cronosium ribicola, obligate parasite that forms cankers. There's a really nice one there in the photo. Uh, that's just about ready to release the acial stage of the spores into the wild to go and infect the alternate host, which is Ribes species, of which we have numerous species in the native environment of British Columbia and Western North America. Um, the rust has five spore stages, two of which occur on Western white pine or the pine host, and the other three on the alternate host, which is Ribes, or relatively recently, it's been discovered that other species like Indian paintbrush uh, also may host the uh, rust in its alternate stage form. And then the infection occurs back to the pine host in the autumn when the basidiospores come off the alternate host and then enter through the needles of the pine and infect the needles the colonization of the needle is fairly quick. The rust transfers down the needle into the fascicle and enters into the branch, usually of the tree, and then starts to form a canker at that point. Uh, these cankers usually take two to three years to develop to the stage that you see in the photo. And once they do, they continue to expand for as long as the host is alive. Um, and they will elongate both proximally and distally to the point of infection. And that's where we get a bit of an issue because as these cankers develop and move down towards the bowl of the tree, they can colonize into the main stem and the canker continues to develop in this characteristic diamond shaped formation until eventually it girdles the main stem, which is fatal to the host. So this problem, as you might guess, is somewhat um, detrimental to recommending Western white pine as a reforestation species in our coastal stands, despite the fact that it's native and quite prolific in certain coastal environments alongside species like Douglas fir and Western red cedar. Uh, it would be a normally a, a fairly large component of stands on the coast, it does not occur to that frequency anymore because it's been removed from those stands and taken out. Um, there's reluctance on the part of foresters to use this tree in reforestation because of the uncertainty provided that it will actually survive to a harvestable age. So why plant a tree that's going to have an 80 plus percent chance of dying before it gets to a useful stage? Uh, there's few treatments that are available to mitigate the infections or any mortality that is subsequently occurs. So there isn't a lot of incentive to put these trees back. Um, if you do a silvicultural treatment like low branch pruning, which seeks to remove the branches 
from the tree, uh, that's going to be an expense. It's going to cost you. There are resistant varieties that are now available that have a major gene resistance that can be used in reforestation. And we advocate the use of those. But again, that's an expense. Uh, it's a more expensive tree to plant. And people are still, because of the long history of the rust being present, leery about even using resistant stock, especially since you can't guarantee them that they're going to have the usual 95% survival. Uh, in areas where we have high rust pressures, even the resistant material may only experience 50% survival. In most cases, it's more on the order of 70 to 80%, but commercial foresters still see that 20 to 30% loss as being just that, a loss to the bottom line, and it's not something that incents them to plant the trees, even when they have a much better chance of survival as resistant stock than they do of native or wild regeneration. So the question comes when you're a forest pathologist dealing with foresters who are doing reforestation work and they're looking at using white pine, the question has come up over the last several decades about whether pruning does work as an effective measure to prevent mortality from blister rust because the blister rust is ubiquitous. Wherever we've planted white pine in the province of British Columbia and other areas, we will get white pine blister rust, even when those um, plantings are well outside the natural range of Western white pine. We find that we get infections in these white pine plantations because it's vectored by other five needle pine species like white bark pine at high elevations and you, and that will transfer the, the rust throughout basically the range of the, wherever we want to plant pine in the province. Can the treatment, if we're looking at pruning, be applied after infections are de detected, which we would label sanitation pruning, so going into a stand after you know it's infected and trying to clean it up to a point where you can increase the survival of the remaining species or the remaining stock on the site um, by doing an intervention treatment? Or do you need to do it prior to having the rust appear in the stand, which we'd label a preventative pruning, where you take mitigative action prior to the rust even appearing in the hope of reducing the chance of inoculation successfully occurring by removing those infection courts or those potential infection courts, which would be on the lower limbs of the regenerating trees. For the most part, western white pine has a high susceptibility to being infected by white pine blister rust in about the lower meter and a half or so of the bowl. So it's that early time prior to age 15 where the tree is the most susceptible and it's those lowest branches closest to the ground that are the most susceptible. And those are the primary avenues where the foliage will get infected, the disease will manifest in the branch and then travel down the branch to the main stem. Um, infections that are a certain distance away from the main stem will not kill the tree, but those distances usually have to exceed 30 to 40 centimeters uh, when the canker forms 30 to 40 centimeters away from the main stem. It's less likely to get that far to contact the main stem and infect it, but infections that are closer are almost guaranteed over the, the lifespan to eventually infect the bull. So the question that we had that we first wanted to answer in the series of questions was, does sanitation pruning work for Western white pine on the coast? Now, <clears throat> this study was, was not really your typical forest pathology study it was more of an archaeological dig in that I had to go back and look at data that was um, from trials that were established prior to my coming along by my predecessors and some other colleagues who had done work in other areas of the province. Uh, almost all the early work that was done on pruning has been done on eastern white pine 
or on east uh, western white pine in the western inland interior of North America. So the BC interior, uh, states of Idaho and Montana, other areas with high white pine populations. And it was done initially in the 70s and 80s to look at the sanitation pruning option where they would walk into stands that are 10, 20, or even older years old. And they would look at those stands, take out the trees that were infected, lop off the infected branches or prune to a certain height in the crown, and then come back later and see whether those trees had survived or not. Uh, there were very few trials on coastal sites where we find the conditions are much different on the coast because it's not kind of a, a in drier interior continental climate. It's a very moist maritime climate and our temperature profiles, our moisture profiles and other environmental variables can be quite different than they would be on the eastern side of the mountain ranges. So the question that we had is, do these interior trials apply to coastal situations? If we carry out the treatments in the coast, will they be effective the way that they're being reported in the literature as being effective in the interior locations? And are these results persistent over time? And this is an important point, as I'll get into in that time makes a difference. And it's not always on your side. So the study is fairly simple. Um, three different studies were combined, two that were on the coast. You'll see the BYA Hill and the Angel Lake sites and the Mount Brenton sites are coastal British Columbia. And there is a site on the right-hand side called Halfway, which is in the interior of BC. Um, just for scale, the coastal sites are about 450 kilometers distant from the interior site. So it's quite a physical distance. The plots were established in 10 to 20 year old naturally regenerated stands. So no resistant species were used. It was all just native regeneration that was allowed to form on post logged sites. And the plots were installed on the sites and some were pruned, the trees were pruned and the other ones they were not. So pretty simple. Uh, we removed from the data after we collected it or what has been collected for over 30 years in some cases for the BYA and Angel Lake sites and the halfway sites 31 and 32 years respectively. Post treatment, the data was collected. Um, these, uh, we called out all the mortality that occurred from other factors such as uh, mortality from root disease or from insect damage. And we just focused on the trees that were affected by rust. So the null hypothesis is that there's gonna be no difference in mortality between the treated pruned trees and the non-treated control trees. I could show you a lot of graphs, but really these sum up, these two sum up the results pretty well. Um, coastal sites got slaughtered in a nutshell. Uh, pruned or unpruned didn't make a difference. Um, mortality rates in both groups exceeded 80%, almost 85% in the not pruned over 31 years post-treatment. So clearly the treatment didn't have much of an effect on the end result. The interesting thing here is though, and it's kind of blurry for me, so it must be really blurry for you, but the first four readings there you can see from the statistical analysis are bolded. And there was a significant statistical difference in the pruned versus non-pruned trees but in reality, that's not really very satisfying to the person that may be looking at this as a demonstration of whether they should do the technique or not, because you're still experiencing after age 16, over 60% mortality, even in your pruned stands. Um, so that's not really very helpful. 65% um, mortality versus 80% mortality is probably not a big consolation for the person conducting this work. 
and it certainly wouldn't be an economic incentive to do the treatment. The interesting thing though here is that most of the trials that were done previously in the interior sites, uh, work that was done by Hungerford in Idaho, work that was done by others, uh, Rich Hunt in particular in BC was very much looking at these sorts of stands in the 80s and 90s um, to see what was happening. Almost all of those showed that when they examined these sanitation pruned stands, that there was a significant difference in survival and that that suggested that the treatments were effective. But almost all of those results were only after 10 or 15 years of examination. We also found a similar pattern, even though it's not very encouraging, that after 16 years post-treatment, there's a significant difference in the treatment regime and the result. But when you look out over 20 years or 30 years, that difference disappears. And essentially, when you extend the observation time out to the point where you, you're now looking mm -hmm. at stands that are 50 years old or so, the, the end result is the treatment really had no effect on the survival of Western white pine. The halfway site, the graph down below, shows the interior site and you can see the survival is better, but it's still not outstanding. After 32 years post-treatment, there's still almost 60% mortality in both the treated and untreated trees. There was really no significant difference at any point in time between the treated and untreated groups over that entire period. Uh, so even though the interior sites have less rust, they get better tree survival over the same period of time. It's still not something to write home about in terms of convincing a, a commercial forester that this is a good thing to do. It'll pay off in the long run. It's, it's just not there. The evidence is not showing you that. So essentially, the thing to point out here is that the coast and the interior results, yes, they're different in terms of survival, but in, in neither case is that particularly encouraging. So the conclusions from this are fairly straightforward. The results from those early studies that were done in the interior uh, of North America, the Inland Empire zone, don't necessarily apply to stands on the coast. And that would be stands that are west of the Cascades in the US or west of the coast range in British Columbia. Uh, the early results, so anything less than 16 years in our case, but in that ballpark, do not necessarily hold up in the longer run. So that's not particularly encouraging to people that are looking at doing short-term studies, perhaps. Um, time does play a role in terms of how these treatment effects hold up in the long run. Sanitation pruning, therefore, we would not recommend as a viable treatment for the for stands on the BC coast simply because it's not buying you anything in that long run. And for those that are interested, need a little help getting to sleep, the full results of this study are found in Canadian Journal of Plant Pathology, uh, our article left from last year in the Rust Special Edition. So I'd like to thank the following. Uh, Ron DePros was my co-author. Unfortunately, Ron didn't survive to see the end of our study and the publication of the results, but I really valued his he has collaboration and cooperation over the years, and he was one of the ones that was around when these trials were started. Uh, BC Ministry of Forests funded the work over the time. We had cooperation from licensees. Uh, Michael Murray, Murray, a colleague, colleague of mine from, mine from the Interior, shared the halfway data as it's his trial site. And thank you to uh, the organizers of the Rust and Peace uh, workshop here especially Nico, who convinced me that I should do this presentation, even though I strongly resisted. Thanks, Nico. No problem. Questions? 
that was not this bad. You, are, you were happy to do it, I'm sure. I think we have one question. Uh, Soren? Yes, um, thank you, Stefan. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, my question is regarding, you might have mentioned it and I probably missed it, uh, about the alternate host to this pathogen. Uh, what's the alternate host and if managing that species of plant might have, uh, could, could, could be helpful for, for managing the disease? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Soren. Yeah, the alternate hosts for the most part are ribes, so currants and gooseberries of which we have several species of native ones, along with also the variety of commercial ones that are planted, some of which, uh, particularly black currants, can be very susceptible and work really well as alternate hosts. So generally controlling those is not an option, just simply because they're so widespread and sometimes very difficult to pick out in natural stands. So controlling them would be difficult and probably earn you the ire of people that would like to see those plants survive. Uh, I see, thank you. One last question, Pascal. Yes, uh, very interesting talk, Stefan. Uh, I was wondering when you say that uh, the lower branch are more susceptible, uh, is it linked to microclimate that would favor infection by basidiospores uh, closer to the oh. ground or another? reason? Uh, there's argument over that point. Um, some people think that you get more rust, particularly when you have the branches lower down that are also um, subject to a lot of uh, low shrub vegetation or, or greenery around the bases where the humidity is kept high and the infections could be facilitated by that environment. But the the studies that I've seen, there's no really conclusive evidence that, uh, that that's the case or that having open stands where you had better ventilation and wind flow through them leads to less infection. So primarily it just seems to be the location on the stem that the younger trees are most susceptible when the um, early on their life, life uh, cycle when the branches are fairly low, uh, but it may not be because of the, the better environment there, because you all, you can also get infections higher up in the crown later on too. So it's, it's not just simply a matter of uh, being low to the ground. I think there's just another question from Melissa. Uh, she's asking if there's a correlation between pathogenic fungi susceptibility and the presence absence of EMF, which are, are uh, EMF. Um, Um, the mycorrhizal fungi, maybe? Yeah, I, yeah, I cannot find the F. <laughs> yeah. Okay, endo mycorrhizal, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah, fungi, of course. I need another coffee. Uh, correlation between pathogenic fungi susceptibility and the present. Uh, no idea. That sounds like a great project for a student. Um, generally, we don't really look at that particular relationship. Um, it would be something that would be more germane probably to uh, root disease or other uh, root problem. Um, I'm not sure whether it would apply in this case, although uh, we did have a speculate, we did have speculation one time that an area that has a lot of natural, um, naturally resistant trees or trees that display um, characteristics that are, are uh, inhibitory to the pathogen uh, were growing in areas that had a higher, high iron concentrations. And they speculated that that may have some effect on whether the pathogen was successful or not, but it, that's about as close as we've come to examining that kind of situation. Thank you, Stefan. I think if there's uh, other question, I can be uh, asked uh, during the break after the next presentation. 
Uh, Gyosharn, you're going to take over to introduce the next uh, speaker. Sure. And can I ask everybody, uh, if you are not asking question or during the presentation, could you mute, please, your uh, microphone? Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. Uh, our next speaker is from uh, the crop side and a friend of mine, Soren Sefi. He is talking about my favorite rust pathogen. And this is the work uh, that he did while he was uh, working with the University of Guelph. Uh, so, Rain. Hello, uh, I'm trying to switch on my. Sorry, it's. I want to have my video on. I don't know, somehow I just missed that. But can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can okay. see your slides. So, yeah, you have seen me, so it's probably my face is not that important. So I go ahead with the presentation now. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity, Gutran, and thanks for the invitation. As uh, And hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a lead plant, uh, plant pathologist at um, um, Aurora Coast, which is a research station of the Aurora Cannabis. Uh, currently, I'm working on uh, resistance to powdery mildew in, in cannabis, but uh, as Gurtran said, uh, this work uh, is um, was done when I was a postdoc at the University of Guelph in the weed breeding lab at um, uh, University of Guelph um, when was uh, I was working with Professor Ali Reza Nawabi, uh, unfortunately, we lost him a couple of years ago to pancreatic cancer. Um, he was a great mentor of mine and, and a very dear friend. So I'm, I'm presenting this work in, in memory of, of him. Um, so uh, as you probably, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, most of the audience are very well familiar with, uh, with this disease. So um, striped rust disease in wheat is caused by Paxinia striformis, um, FSP to TC, and um, so we call it PST, uh, which is a major threat, um, emerging threat to wheat production in Canada, in the world, particularly in Canada in recent years, causing up to 70% of crop loss. And uh, we have some reports showing that the pathogen um, has um, undergone some mutation that uh, made him to be adapted to higher temperature. Therefore, um, more regions uh, is being attacked uh, by new strains of the pathogen. So it's becoming more and more an important pathogen for wheat production um, in Canada. Uh, I'm uh, by education, I'm not a ROST pathologist, but uh, my background is more in uh, molecular plant pathology. I, I got my PhD um, back in Belgium, University of Ghent, where I worked on uh, molecular defense mechanisms against uh, fungal pathogens. So in this work, I specifically focus on um, effective resistance mechanisms uh, against uh, this pathogen. So the life cycle of, of uh, a PST um, as a biotrophic pathogen um, is that you, when, when the spore lands on the surface of the leaf, we have germination occurs within 24 hours and uh, penetration um, in, in one or uh, the second or two days post inoculation is um, established through the uh, penetration into the stomata of the host. And um, within one week, we have the um, colonization of the mesophilic tissue of the leaf, uh, very well established when the pathogen is able to develop a hostoria and establish that um, uh, biotrophic interaction when it's host. Within two weeks, we typically see a sporulation phase uh, being um, completed and where that's, that's the stage that we, with naked eyes, we are able to see pustules on the surface of the leaf, uh, uh, which are actually filled with spores of the pathogen and the life cycle of pathogen is complete. Those spores will land in new on, on new leaf surfaces and, and restart the life cycle of the pathogen. Um, it is widely believed that hypersensitive response is um, um, the most effective defense mechanism of the host against this pathogen. And 
Um, I know we, we are, I'm speaking to plant pathologists, so I don't need to explain that, but it's, as you probably know, it's a kind of program cell death where um, the, the host and plant resistant host uh, sacrifices parts of its tissue and kills um, highly localized cells, particularly those ones in close contact with the pathogen where the pathogen is attempting to penetrate into the tissue. Uh, in order to restrict the growth of the pathogen and suppress its colonization. Here we um, tested the effect of um, silicon application to, to see if, because silicon is known as a, a potent plant defense activator in, in other crops and, and, and wheat as well, against a broad spectrum of different pathogen, pathogen will do, even necrotrophic pathogen um, like botrytis. Um, so, um, so we wanted to see if silicon application might be effective in induct, um, inducing hypersensitive response against uh, uh, PST. And here you can see. I hope that my my the, the arrow is can be seen here. Um, this is a very susceptible genotype, uh, Thatcher genotype of of wheat, which is highly susceptible to PST, and at least the isolate that we were working with. And uh, you see, after the application of silicon, we we could see in, in some of the treated plant, uh, HR is happening. So this is a typical HR, the chlorotic patches can be seen on, on, on the leaf. And when you do microscopy on those parts of, uh, that are undergoing HR, you could see that this like specific cells accumulating hydrogen peroxide and the brownish color here is the result of uh, diaminobenzidine is staining, which can, you can visualize accumulation of hydrogen peroxide, which is a signaling molecule that induces um, HR. Um, and yeah, in, and then autofluorescence, where, which is due to accumulation of phenolic compounds and deposition of phenolic compounds in the cell wall. So making the cell wall fortified and the penetration of the pathogen more difficult. So yeah, HR is widely known as, uh, the main defense mechanism against, against this disease. That was the message of this slide. However, when we um, study um, uh, different kind of uh, resistant responses of uh, I mean, different hosts, including wheat, against uh, ROS diseases, you typically see a range of different reactions from um, highly susceptible reactions where the whole surface of the leaf is colonized <laughs> by postures of the disease and um, lower degrees of, of disease colonization, which uh, typically are classified in different groups or, or classes, nine classes typically. And here I'm, I'm presenting five different classes. And number one is where you have, uh, you see this prolation phase of the pathogen is totally suppressed and we have hypersensitive response. And then the, um, actually the main topic of this talk is about number zero. When you inoculate a resistant host and you, the host remains totally asymptomatic and nothing can be seen even not HR reaction as if you have not inoculated the plant. Um, the question that we try to answer in this research study, which was my previous postdoc at the lab of Professor Navabi was um, to know um, what's going on in this situation. Is, is the spores or spores of the pathogen are able to germinate if they are able to um, develop germ tube, if the germ tube is able to penetrate. So why we don't see any symptom in this kind of situation? A very um, informative and uh, actually highly advanced kind of research study was recently published um, uh, by uh, Kalimiuk um, and, and her, her team um, on um, Avocet wire 15, uh, which is uh, a actually um, highly resistant um, cultivar genotype of wheat, which, which harbors the YR15 resistant gene and shows broad spectrum resistance to different strains of, of PST. And in their work, they showed that um, uh, indeed, um, YR15 belongs to a kinase to the kinase protein family that, that induces hypersensitive response against this, this pathogen. Um, 
nevertheless, and, and very interestingly, they also reported that depending on the cultivar or genotype of um, genotype of, of wheat, I think that uh, one, one mic is open, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, depending on the genotype of the host and the strain of the pathogen, in some uh, cases, although the majority of cases of resistance is um, controlled through hypersensitive response, but there are cases that uh, remain totally asymptomatic. And uh, so again, there's another a piece of evidence that um, in um, rare cases, we have that kind of immunity or full immunity against this pathogen. Again, uh, interesting to know uh, how the resistance mechanism is controlled in, that, in those situations. So this is a, um, uh, my work um, at Weed Breeding Lab, um, um, it's Avocet Wire 15 versus uh, Avocet S, which is the background of this uh, genotype, which is highly susceptible to, to the pathogen. And the white powder you see here is not due to any powder window or something. This is a talc powder that we use to inoculate our plants. So we mix this spore, um, we mix this spore of, of the pathogen with this talc powder and the uh, brushed actually particular surfaces of the leaf to, to do our inoculation, but uh, it's, um, it, it remains fully asymptomatic. And this strain of the isolate of the pathogen that showed this kind of response on AVER wire 15 was collected our, in our um, research station in Elora, Ontario. Um, and, and we collected that, I mean, Mitra, Dr. Mitra Sirajazari, who is a a plant pathologist at the weed breeding lab and a joint professor uh, there, uh, she collected this isolate of the uh, pathogen. And we saw that with this isolate of pathogen, wire 15 shows a uh, fully um, uh, asymptomatic reaction. That's another uh, view of, of the situation of uh, reaction of opposite wire 15 to this isolate of pathogen. You could see here after two weeks, postules. Uh, of uh, the disease is totally uh, as, as fully formed and pathogen is pretty happy. And uh, the, the reason be behind that blue color is that it's, it's sustained with tripon blue for fungal structures. So that's why you see the fungal structures in blue color. However, in under resistant uh, genotype, uh, there is no trace, that's interesting. So after two weeks, there's no trace of any pathogen, but believe me, we inoculated these plants very heavily but we were not able to retrieve or see any trace of the pathogen up to two weeks, which is interesting. Or um, there were some, some uh, exceptions that I'm going to explain right, uh, shortly. So let's see um, the microscopic level, what's going on there. So at four days post inoculation in our susceptible genotype, the, uh, this is a spore of the pathogen. Again, the blue color due is due to the staining method that we use is germinated and the germ tube is fully developed. It is able to locate the stomata of the host. And as you can see, it goes through the stomata to establish its penetration. However, interestingly, in our resistant genotype, uh, I was at wire 15, germination is happening pretty successfully. Germ tube is growing towards the location of the stomata, but what it reaches to this to the location with stomata, it just goes around it and it's not able to go through it. It's as if something is preventing the pathogen from, from penetration. Could be an antimicrobial compound that repels the pathogen, uh, the germ tube of the pathogen or the stomata being totally closed or whatever happens here, you see this kind of avoidance and, and pathogen around the stomata. I hope that it's clear on this screen, but this is a magnified version of that. So this, you can see that it goes around. And we see at seven days post inoculation, again, lots of successful germination and penetration is happening through stomata on the susceptible genotype. However, in the resistant genotype, these red arrows showing the location of different stomata where the pathogen just goes around it and is not able to penetrate. So, and probably the reason behind this long and kind of abnormally grown germ tube of the pathogen is that is that it's just desperately searching for an entry point and wherever it, it faces and stomata, it's just, there's no, there's no uh, red carpet uh, available. It's just uh, no entrance and it's rejection and the pathogen just goes longer and grows longer and longer to be able to find. As you know, the 
nutrient content of the spores are pretty limited. Of, um, 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 if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Gurdjian, I think that probably within 24 hours or 48 hours, um, the, the pathogen needs to be able to establish its colonization, otherwise it cannot survive. So, um, and that's exactly what happens. So after two days, three days, the pathogen is not able to penetrate into tissue. There's no food, there's no nutrient available. And that's why we see after two weeks post inoculation, no penetration, so no growth of the pathogen and no trace of its growth on the leaf surface. However, in the susceptible interaction, you, can, you could see that uh, pustules are successfully formed and spores are generated and the life cycle of the pathogen is, is complete. We did RNA sequencing on, on these samples to see um, at the um, transcriptional level uh, what's going on there. And uh, interestingly, we saw that um, a couple of groups of genes are highly activated throughout this interaction, genes related to the stress response, uh, an immunity system. And one important group of gene that was uh, um, actually um, overactivated was uh, or highly represented was those genes controlling basic metabolism, controlling um, central CN metabolism, controlling cell viability and photosynthesis in, in the host. I'd like to just uh, add this um, slide here um, and talk about uh, the concept of endurance and evasion, which are actually two opposite states of uh, reaction towards different pathogenic scenarios in, in uh, resistant plants. Um, my PhD was mainly focused on the modification of central metabolism, amino acid metabolism in response to different pathogenic scenarios, biotrophic versus nectrotrophic um, uh, pathogenic uh, strategies. And uh, if you want to read more about it, that's my paper in MPMI is available. Um, so by endurance, uh, as you know, um, necrotrophic pathogens kills their whole cells and they feed on that tissue. So killing uh, cell death is highly favor favorable for these kind of pathogens. So in, in response to that kind of virulence strategy, resistant plants are able to overactivate those metabolic pathways controlling basic metabolism, replenishing central CN metabolism and maintaining cell viability as a kind of counter um, action or kind of retaliation in response to cell death favoring um, virulence strategy of the pathogen. So this kind of state is called endurance. So where where cell viability is maintained by this host uh, plant to um, keep the uh, necrotrophic pathogen away. On the other hand, um, in response to those pathogens that favor cell viability, like biotrophic pathogen, like powder mildew pathogens and rust pathogens that are obligate biotrophs, um, resistant plants induce cell death. They want to keep those um, living tissue away from the um, biotrophic pathogen. So these are the metabolic pathways are being activated in resistant cells and hypersensitive response and PCD is typically autophagy. These are the type of uh, resistant responses uh, to, to these kind of pathogens. So something which is interesting in our wire 15, at least in our RNA-seq data that we, we, we saw that was that this endurance response um, is highly activated in our wire 15 response to pathogen, which is kind of counterintuitive because we expect, uh, we knew that hypersensitive response was the main mechanism. And actually we were expecting to see that kind of reaction. So what I remember that the first time that I was checking my plants, I was searching for uh, those chlorotic patches on, on uh, our wire 15, but it was just, nothing was there as if we didn't, we repeated that experiment again, no HR reaction was seen. So this, it seems that, now to the final model of the story, it seems that when um, the spores landed in this, uh, um, this kind of resistive response is um, activated in a way that the plant is able to sense the presence of the spores on, on, the, on the leaf surface in a very timely manner. 
and somehow the penetration of the spores are, are fully suppressed. And when the penetration is not happening, the plant doesn't need to activate those energy intensive metabolic pathways and induce cell death. Instead, it just takes care of and, and protects its photosynthesis and basic metabolism, the cell viability in the region because it wants to just, uh, as you know, it, there's a trade-off between defense and, and growth. So the focus is in defense in, in terms of just to prevent, to prevent the pathogen from entering into the tissue and at the same time, taking care of the basic metabolism in the invaded region. So no penetration, no cytoplasmic interaction between the pathogen and the host, and therefore no HR. And hence we have this kind of probably PAM triggered immunity mediated the stomatal defense in VR50. I, I'd like to finish with this slide. Um, as, as I told you right now, I'm working on cannabis. And, um, and interestingly enough, I'm seeing similar symptoms in one of our resistant genotypes where the plant is, as you can see here, that that particular genotype is fully surrounded by highly susceptible genotypes, is able to um, um, suppress the growth of pathogen, remains fully asymptomatic. And interestingly enough, the, the mechanisms are highly similar to what I previously observed on I was at wire 15 against the isolated PSD that, that we had. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time. And if there's any question, uh, uh, please. Thank you, Soren. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Anyone, any question? Daniel, we can't hear you. Can you type your question? So Ron asked a question that is there any virulence on wire 15 anywhere in the world? Uh, yes, there has been reports that uh, uh, it's been broken. Uh, that's Kurchan, you're the specialist in this case. But I know that there are reports that wire 15 is broken and there are uh, isolates of PSD that, that can in fact, can be virulent. Sure, I think um, there are only two races or two isolates that we know are virulent on wire 15 and those are maintained by uh, Danish group at Global Rust Reference Center at Aarhus University in Denmark, but uh, at least in North America or Asia, there are, I, I'm not familiar of any reports of virulence on wire 15 so it's, it's still holding up and it, it's a, it's still very useful gene when it comes to resistance breeding. Uh, Mason's question is, did this defense mechanism remain active if you cross it with the susceptible genotype? We have not done that. I have not done that at least. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Is it is it dominant, uh, Gushran? No, it's my question. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's a dominant uh, gene. And uh, I think uh, probably this uh, HR or non-HR response also depends on a uh, uh, genetic background of uh, the carrier parent, right? Because if we reflect on uh, pictures from uh, Valentina's paper on wire 15 cloning, some genotypes uh, showed HR whereas others did not, right? Yes, exactly. And then Daniel's question is, oh, uh, Mason's other question is, PAM triggered immunity PTIE, there should be a receptor involved in it. Yeah, we very good question. Yeah, we in our RNA seq data, we didn't have any candidates. We couldn't. Might be something unknown. We, we had some uh, um, some genes um, or transcripts being highly upregulated, but they were actually not annotated. So it could be one of those that we uh, detected, but something that we know and receptor that has been already reported um, was missing in our RNA seq uh, study. Yeah. Daniel's question. question is, Daniel's question is, how many races show no HR on wire 15? 
Um, in our lab, this was the only race, at least till three, two years ago that I was working there. Um, that was the only race that showed no HR. We, after me, another scientist in our lab tested another strain on, uh, I was at wire 15 and they saw um, pretty obvious HR reaction on I was at wire 15. So uh, as far as I know, and then at the time, he was the only strain that we collected from Allura station that led to this kind of immunity response on wire 15. Yeah. Thank you, Sore. You're welcome. Uh, You're welcome. And thank you, everyone, for uh, your questions. So now we will take a 20 minute break and then we will resume our uh, workshop at 11. Uh, you feel free to stay online or chat with your colleagues if you want, or if you want to go grab coffee, that's also optional. And if in the meantime, you have more questions for Soren, you can just type it in chat. And if he won't be here, he can answer it pro uh, probably after we resume the workshop or during the break. Of course, it will be my pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity, Gosha. Here now. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Welcome uh, back, everyone. I think we should start our uh, second part of the workshop um, for the three remaining talks. And our first speaker for the second part is uh, Firdisa Bakor. Uh, Bakore, uh, I think. Uh, yes, you're right. Pardon my pronunciation. And uh, he will talk about QTL mapping for rust resistance in uh, um, hexaploid and tetraploid wheat. Firdisa, you can start. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this and to make this presentation. So uh, the topic, the title of my presentation today is uh, molecular mapping and uh, identification of rest resistance genes in common and durum wheat lines utilized in Canadian breeding. So uh, I myself and then Dr. Sronox, uh, Richard Kurt, uh, Yvon Groan, and uh, Samia Boris from AC Swift Current have been involved in this presentation. So, yeah. So as a way of, uh, I organized my presentation in three sections. Uh, I'll give you a brief background on uh, stem rust and rust diseases and wheat. And uh, then uh, we'll talk on mapping stem rust resistance loci effective in Kenya in Canadian spring wheat lines, AC Prevail uh, BW961. Then talk on uh, high density genetic mapping of stripe rust resistance uh, in a strong field by blackbird durum wheat population. So um, wheat rust, as uh, everybody knows, are the most feared diseases of uh, wheat. Uh, well, this, uh, your, uh, your slide is still, uh, like you're still stuck at slide one. And did you move your slide? Yes. Uh, we can't see it. Maybe do you want to uh, start slideshow? Uh, okay. So yeah, now it's working. Uh, it's working now. Yes. Now we can. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it. sorry. Do you have the possibility to put it in full screen? Uh, it's on full screen now. Oh, okay. So can you guys see now? uh no it's is not, it a movie it's not the full screen it's um, um like did you start the slideshow yeah uh, i think as know. long as you can move on to next yeah. slide should be okay uh, but uh, uh yeah it's working. You, oh let, let me sh record slideshow so it's on full screen now Yes, now it, yes, now it's fine. Can you see that? Yes, yes. Okay, so so uh, this is um, the outline of my presentation, and um, uh, I'll talk on the stem rust and the stripe rust diseases of wheat, and then uh, on two papers which were published in the Canadian uh, Journal of Plant uh, Pathology uh, Special Issue. One is on stem rust in uh, hexaploid wheat, and then uh, second one on uh, 
Cyprus uh, residents in uh, Durham Heat. So uh, as a background, uh, we trust the are uh, the most feared uh, diseases of it uh, because of their history, uh, uh, long-term history uh, in terms of the devastation they co uh, caused in one feet. Historically, if, uh, stem rust uh, was the most destructive disease, for instance, in uh, North America and uh, frequent Epidemics have occurred uh, between 1900 uh, to 1955. Thereafter, uh, uh, the use of uh, high yielding, uh, high uh, resistant varieties uh, curbed the disease and then it wasn't um, no more uh, very important. And again, Cypress was uh, reported in early 1900 in both Canada and um, uh, U.S., but it's limited to specific uh, Pacific Northwest uh, of U.S. and uh, South uh, Alberta and British Columbia until 2000. So uh, there are, we have uh, recent challenges and uh, Rust is uh, gaining more importance in North America, for instance, since recently, since two, 2000. For striped rust, uh, uh, the incursion of the new rice, uh, uh, which is very invasive and highly virulent uh, and known as PSDS1 uh, from uh, the Mediterranean region, just traveled a long way to North America. And then this uh, rice is uh, high, adapted to warm uh, temperature climates and then uh, now is. Uh, uh, threatening wheat production in non-traditional striped areas as well. And uh, the other one is uh, UG99, which a race of stem rust, which uh, 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 overcame uh, the uh, widely known uh, SR gene, which was uh, SR31, uh, and that is deployed uh, very well in many other cultivars in, in Asia and Africa and so many other countries. And then this uh, RS has uh, again uh, evolved to many uh, variants, around 30 nowadays registered, uh, recorded in different countries. So the this race uh, uh, also, uh, many of the cultivars, uh, over 80%, 80 to 90% uh, of the cultivars grown on, on, around, around the globe are susceptible to uh, UG99 and its variant. So uh, it's a challenging for uh, wheat, produ uh, wheat producers. Uh, so uh, it's useful to uh, deploy, uh, employ uh, preemptive breeding uh, strategy uh, where there is no rust uh, breeders uh, to, to, to protect or uh, uh, in the incursion of virulent races such as like UG99 and other uh, evolving races. Uh, at uh, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, breeders and pathologists evaluate the germplasm uh, against rust as uh, in artificially inoculated uh, field nurseries in Canada and uh, uh, abroad, uh, just at, uh, for instance, at FC stations in different locations. Uh, we uh, evaluate our germplasm in every year and then send uh, several of uh, several lines to uh, uh, Injoro for UG99 evaluation and uh, uh, some uh, like to Mexico and New Zealand for other uh, rust species, uh, uh, rust races or local races that are found there. And then uh, if the picture at, you look at this background, uh, uh, is a safe current uh, F2 nursery, a space plant nursery, for instance, where over 300,000 uh, single plants are evaluated every year. Uh, we need an inoculate uh, or germplasm for um, and the test breeder rows uh, for leaf rust and the stem rust. And then we also uh, get some uh, natural stripe rust infection uh, depending on the year. So with that remark, uh, I'll uh, talk on the uh, uh, published uh, research on mapping stem rust resistance uh, loss effective in Kenya, uh, in uh, Canadian spring wheat uh, lines, AC Prevail and BW96. This is uh, for UG99 resistance. 
So as a background, the two of the lines uh, which were used as a uh, parents for the population, AC Prevail and BW921, uh, have observed it to be uh, to show moderate resistance to UG99 in the variants. So, uh, but we uh, wanted uh, the uh, resistance genes were not known. So, the objective of this uh, study was to identify uh, regions of uh, regions. Genomic regions associated with uh, UG99 stem rust resistance in these two lines. So uh, we developed uh, a double haploid population of uh, 227 uh, lines uh, from the cross uh, AC prevailed by BW961. And uh, stem rust uh, field evaluation was conducted at Injuro from 2016 to 2019 for four years. And then uh, where susceptible field uh, spreader dose were inoculated with UG99 and its variants. And the disease severity was, uh, disease severity and infection response uh, were recorded. Uh, we also did a, a seedling test on the parents uh, uh, at uh, more than uh, research uh, and development center. And uh, the Population was genotyped and the genetic mapping was uh, performed based on uh, 5,000 5, SNP markers, uh, which were selected from 90K infinim uh, SNP array. And genetic mapping, uh, mapping was uh, conducted using join map 5 and then QTL analysis was uh, performed on uh, map kit using map QTL 6. So the seedling study, I show, have shown that uh, both AC Prevail and uh, BW96, which are the parental lines, were, uh, I mean, are susceptible to TTKSK, so at seedling stage. And then uh, the, uh, that means they don't have any major gene which uh, is uh, uh, effective against UG99 at seedling, at least. So the field study uh, sh have shown that. Uh, if you look at this table, uh, the uh, on the stem rust severity and infection response of the populations against for in uh, across four years, there was a wide range of uh, stem rust severity and infection response uh, observed between between the lines of the population, and then uh, the looking at the mean of the population. The disease pressure was higher in 2016 and the 2017, uh, 2019, uh, and the, the parents have uh, as a, uh, had shown medium uh, uh, moderately resistant, uh, moderate resistance in both years, uh, in uh, in both cases. So, uh, and again, they they were uh, moderately resistant. In, if you look at the infection response of the parents. And at the in uh, in 2019, uh, they had a little bit of higher, I mean, uh, infection response, which was moderately susceptible. So, uh, looking at the uh, frequency distribution of the stem rust severity at the enduro, uh, was uh, uh, there was a, a continuous distribution for stem rust severity. If you look at the a number of lines on the y-axis and then uh, similar severity on the x-axis. And then uh, the, the bar graphs are showing, uh, the colored graphs are for the years. So there generally it was continuous and then uh, most of the lines have shown a low uh, uh, stem blast reading, uh, which means the two parents have uh, contributed to resistance so uh, the QTL analysis, this, is a, this table shows you the result of the QTL analysis. Uh, we've uh, found that uh, uh, at least five QTLs uh, were uh, detected in the population. Uh, so, but two of the QTLs, uh, one on chromosome 7AL and the other on chromosome 2BS, uh, were uh, consistent across 
for uh, environment is uh, at injury. So, and the, the, especially the first QTL, uh, on a, which was detected, uh, contributed by AC Previal, uh, had uh, uh, ex just explained almost close to 39% of the phenotypic variation in the stem rust severity and infection response. And uh, looking, this is uh, at the, one of the significant findings we found in this uh, population. And the second one is uh, from the, the chromo on chromosome 2 bs which was uh, uh, also contributed by a different, the second parent, EW961. Uh, so the looking at the other quitels, they were detected uh, only in single years. So they were not such important. Uh, looking at the seven, the consistent quetel, uh, which was uh, detected on seven AL uh, chromosome, and uh, we compared this quetel uh, with uh, already reported uh, SR genes uh, on the uh, seven AL chromosome. There were two uh, SR genes, SR15 and SR25, which were reported. Uh, uh, on the chromosome, uh, looking at the position on the consensus ma map we published and uh, previously, uh, uh, just looking at the markers which were associated with uh, SR15 and 25, uh, 22, uh, 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 along just compared with uh, 7 al QTL, they were not far from uh, located, uh, not far from the 7L QTL. They were in, in proximity, like at least 15, cent 15 to 17 centimorgan away from the uh, 7L QTL. But uh, these uh, SR15 and SR22 uh, are seedling genes, so uh, they they are uh, effective against TTKSK, whereas uh, they Quetel contributing to S, uh, SE Prevail, that's 7AL, is uh, apparent is um, susceptible. So uh, the two genes, uh, SR15 and SR22, could not be uh, represent the 7AL Quetel. And again, we, we uh, uh, looked at the line which carries uh, SR15 and was uh, planted at Angoro during the experimental years 2016 and 2019, and it was susceptible uh, at field condition, whereas uh, AC Prevail is uh, uh, resistant to the gene, uh, to S, uh, UG99, I mean. So um, in conclusion, the 7AL QTL uh, from AC Prevail could be a novel gene. That's our conclusion. <laughs> And we also looked at the second consistent QTL, which was uh, contributed by BW961. And uh, there on chromosome 2BS, uh, there are at least four designated genes uh, which were reported already. And then uh, compare, uh, we compared the position of the uh, uh, these SR genes against the two uh, chromosome 2BS QTL. Uh, and then uh, SR39 was uh, in close proximity with, with the uh, 7L3 uh, uh, 2BS QTL. But uh, uh, again, uh, if you look at the reaction of uh, this, uh, this four, uh, three uh, genes uh, against UG99 or TTKSK, uh, the SR36, 39, SR4, and 40 are uh, seedling resistant uh, genes. Then that means they are uh, effective as seedling stage, whereas BW961 is susceptible. And so uh, again, we, there was that we checked the uh, whether SR23 is also a similar gene with uh, gene. You know, QTL, which we found from BW961 uh, and the uh, SR23 is um, a pleiotropic uh, uh, kind of gene with uh, LR16 and LSR23 uh, are in either closely linked or pleiotropic genes. And we 
I used a diagnostic marker and then checked, uh, made, uh, conducted a marker assay on the parents, and the, both parents seem as appear to have uh, LR16, SR23. LR16 is common in Canadian with germplasm. So again, uh, we concluded from our just uh, study that uh, the 2 ps quetel from BW961 likely is a novel uh, gene. And then uh, we looked at uh, the individual and the combined effects of the two consistent quetels uh, we found uh, at Injuro uh, from uh, two uh, Canadian wheat lines. And uh, looking at the graphs, uh, at this graph, uh, the x-axis shows where the combined and the individual, I mean, uh, yeah, ketels. Uh, the, so the two B, A, B plus 7A ketels uh, synergistically uh, reduced uh, stem rest resistance uh, and uh, was significant, especially during 2018 and 2019. So uh, the conclusion is that uh, uh, the 2 BS quetel from BW961 and ASC7L quetel from B, the ASC prevail are most likely represent novel genes and then their co occurrence, in fact, has elevated disease resistance. And uh, uh, stacking these uh, the two quetels with uh, uh, other genes, especially uh, like LSR card, which is also uh, was also identified in Canadian with uh, line AC uh, Cadillac could improve the durability of uh, resistance. So uh, improvements can be made in our germplasm still. That's, that's a message for this one. And then uh, the other uh, work uh, which we rep uh, reported on Canadian Journal of Plant Pathologies uh, uh, High density genetic mapping of striped rust uh, resistance in a, a, a drum with population and strong field by a blackbird. Uh, so, strong field is a high yielding variety and it has high protein and low uh, protein and high uh, low cadmium concentration. It's the major parent nowadays for uh, modern cultivars, uh, durum cultivars, and uh, but it is susceptible to striped rust, and at least uh, in Canada. So again, the blackbird uh, is on accession, a tetraploid with accession, and uh, was observed with to express uh, stri uh, striped rust resistance uh, during epidemic years recently in Canada. So uh, the objective of um, uh, our study was to uh, uh, identify a map and identify genomic regions associated with uh, striped rust resistance in these two populations, uh, in, in these uh, two lines. So uh, we've developed uh, eight, seven uh, double haploids from the cross and uh, of a strong field and uh, blackbird. Uh, and, uh, these lines were uh, evaluated for star uh, rust response at Let Bridge uh, uh, AFC and uh, from 2016 and 20, uh, to 2019, and uh, at uh, Tolucas, uh, Mexico, uh, from 2017 to 2019. At Let Bridge, the spreader rows were uh, inoculated with uh, local races. Whereas at Toluca, susceptible spreaders plants were uh, inoculated with PSA isolate uh, MX1604, uh, which is a recent uh, I mean, race uh, which was uh, introduced to North America in 2000. And uh, we uh, data on uh, rust this severity was uh, collected and then the population was uh, genotyped and the leakage maps were based on uh, 9DK SNP, uh, I select infinium RA and then SSR markers as well. So the critical analysis was uh, 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 performed on map using map ketel 6. So looking at the uh, 
summary of stripe rust data at uh, both uh, sites, uh, Lebridge and Toluca. There was a, a wide range uh, of uh, uh, stripe rust uh, severity at both locations, and the uh, lines behaved differently. At, uh, and then, uh, so uh, looking at the parents, strong field was uh, as expected, uh, was showing a high disease I mean, uh, scores in Canada compared to Blackbird, but it, it was a vice versa at, uh, at uh, CMIT or Toluca. So if you look at the distribution of the lines or uh, in response to stri uh, stripe rust severity, uh, uh, looking at the, the number of lines on the y-axis and the stripe rust severity on the uh, uh, x-axis. Uh, this is an example from Toluca. So uh, the severity was continuous and then uh, with higher number of lines showing uh, uh, low DC severity. So this, uh, that means the two parents have contributed to additively to the uh, disease resistance. So in this case, also, we we found uh, four uh, retails associated with the rest resistance. Uh, only one of the retails was uh, detected across uh, regions or countries. Well, that was uh, the the first retail on, on three a dot two. Uh, so this critical was detected in three or all those locations except one uh, in Canada. So it is, and it is uh, derived from Blackbird. And uh, uh, the other heaters like 3.1 uh, was detected in Toluca and then it's also coming from, uh, uh, derived from Blackbird and the, there is another critical which was detected on chromosome two, but uh, it was uh, this was contributed by a strong field. Uh, so a strong field has uh, uh, shown some resistance in in Mexico, but not in Canada at all. And there was another critical on uh, chromosome farm B, and it was detected in 2016 at Lebridge, but uh, not in other places, in other years. Looking at the uh, the consistent critical which was detected in this population, that's three a dot three a dot two uh, uh, from Blackbird. This is an uh, a, the most interesting critical which we identified in this uh, study, and uh, this. Uh, Retail was found at uh, on chromosome uh, three AL on the long arm of the chromosome at a five centimorgan interval, and uh, we check uh, literature showed that there was no uh, uh, Y R gene reported on chromosome three AL. So uh, we this could be uh, a new gene. So in conclusion, uh, the uh, identification of the uh, three uh, to retail from Blackbird is a particular and uh, in, uh, particularly interesting and because it represents a novel and a stable retail, which is effective in at least two countries in uh, in and the multiple environments. So with this, uh, uh, I'll end up my presentation by thanking or acknowledging our contributors. And uh, uh, there were many uh, people and institutions who were uh, involved in this uh, research. And there's a list of funders. Thank you so much for. Thank you, Ferdisa. Um, uh time for questions we we can take a few questions
हरबंस कुछ क्वेश्चन गुच्चा नो यस आई हैव अ कमेंट आई एस आर फिफ्टीन इज अफेक्टिव अगेंस्ट जूजी नाइनटी नाइन दैट वाज अ डॉगमा व्हेन पीपल सेड इट्स नॉट अफेक्टिव एंड वी पब्लिश्ड अ पेपर विद अमेरिकन ग्रुप टू क्लियर दैट डॉगमा एस आर फिफ्टीन सर्टेनली इज वेरी अफेक्टिव इन केनिया even though it's not effective elsewhere do you have a a comment on that ferdisa or yeah sr15 is also uh, temperature sensitive at seedling stage in fact uh, and uh, just only the line which was planted uh, uh, there for uh, during the experimental period at least uh, uh, this line was susceptible during the whole four years uh harbansi you know i've seen that the paper as well get yeah anyways it's it's difficult to score for this sir that's why people call it susceptible it's not susceptible because that was the major issue which i had with jujin and eventually in 2015 we managed to convince him mm-hmm. that certainly is scoring wasn't happening properly so it was tough task to convince him but we have about uh, probably 10 varieties which we have tested repeatedly over in kenya and they are always mrms around that mark yet <clears throat> that's that's a uh, useful information mason have a question that uh, what are the candidate genes in this qtl interval uh mason is it about sr15 or um stripe crest qtl fredisa do you want to answer that question yeah the, are we are reporting this uh, especially in this um the sr genes uh, the one on 7 al and then 2 bsk till as uh, new genes for us uh, based on our at least literature review and then uh, on our seed seedling study but i don't know whether there are other candidate genes which can be i mean similar uh, at least for now we don't have thank you pradesh any last question no thank you pradesh for your talk we will move on to our next speaker who is uh, not here uh, uh, but he sent us his uh, recording uh, of, of uh, the talk because he's from australia it's very early morning and uh, uh, he uh, chose to send us his recording uh, i would like to give a brief introduction of our next speaker even though he's not here uh, dr benjamin schwessinger is uh, a fungal biologist uh, 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 located at australian national university in canberra he received his phd from the sainsbury lab and he is very well known for his work on fungal genetics fungal genomics and uh, fungal biology and for last uh, few years he is working on wheat stripe rust and other rust pathogens with his australian and international colleagues um yes nico can i request you to share his recording <clears throat> yeah i can do that yeah uh pretty so you can stop sharing your that, that's okay i, I took control <clears throat> I have control now. Okay, well, uh, if we are ready, Gershon, I can press play. Sure. Yeah. And we see what happen. Sure. Professor Gershon, Professor Gershon, to invite me. Can you hear everybody? Yes. Yeah, I can hear properly. Okay, let's go. To this workshop with the Canadian Phytopathology Society Rust Workshop. rest in peace i really appreciate it being invited apologies i can't be here otherwise because it was a little early my time and um i decided not to get up this early because 4:30 was too much for me considering that i have the, one of my students exam today 
and other things to do too. They need to be a little fresh. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I think it would be also good to in future to have like a more gender diverse um, panel. I hope you can all work on this together. So I changed my title slightly today. So I changed my title to capture not only striped rust, but actually also a little bit of the myrtle rust work we do because it is both a workshop also on forestry and agriculture. So I thought it would be actually very suitable. So I'm currently at the Australian National University that it's in Canberra in Australia. We just got a good new government so you can even welcome, uh, come visit them. We're not gonna destroy your climate all at once. And if you wanna reach me, you can either reach me here via by email um with me here by email or on twitter if you like all right so first of all i would like to really acknowledge the people who do most of the work i do just push paper most of the time nowadays um so we do work on myrtle rest it's a big uh project in our lab and i come to this this uh with tamene uh Talesa, uh, Senyan Liu, uh, she's doing a PhD with us, and myself, I do work a little bit on it when I get to it. Um, we do work on wheat rusts, mostly on stripe rust, but we have facilitated others to really excel in the stem rust work, and also in recent relief rust work um, at CSIO, so we supported them which they were quite extensively at one point in time. So we have a, quite a suite of people working now on stripe rust, basically, most of the time because we're really after ABRs and we really would like to make this happen. And we have some good leads, which are not presentable just yet. So apologies for that. Then we have like a person, like a good lead for genome person, Alice Jones in the lab. We do a little bit of rust, rust genomics or, or, or uh, genomics in general. And this was of Puxinia controlina. Again, I will not touch on this. This is a biocontrol agent for skeleton mutants. This is a good friend at Zyro in the bio, uh, security section there with Game and Hunter, Dr. Game and Hunter. So that will be hopefully written up soon and published later on. And then we also work on the microbiome and pathogen detection in general. So basically, translating our knowledge, we get into wheat rust and myrtle rust quite uh, rapidly into actionable outcomes. So detection of myrtle rust, for example, of air sample spores we're working on, and also rust, other rust and air sample spores uh, with collaborators across Australia. Um, that's pretty exciting. Um, and we also do some machine learning around this and so on. And this is really led by Tabish Ains. Uh, she just finished this. Some one of the projects she's currently wrapping up and Abigail Great started it. And we have a research project which was funded by the federal government on using uh, metagenomics and metabarcoding for plant pathogen detection from air samples for us. All right, so that's what we do. That's a really lovely group of great people. And uh, thanks for doing the science with me. All right, so Rust, I give a little bit of introduction even so that might be a little bit um, known um, by lots of people. So the Rust fungi are really a long problem in Western culture. They've been really going back to the Greek and Roman times, which is roughly like, Two, three thousand years. Um, so, for example, the Romans had a god, Rubigus, where they celebrated in April with sacrifices of animals to a piece. Uh, so, that gay, they get a better uh, harvest every year. So, rusts have been around for a very long time in agriculture in these settings and has been always a problem. And if you have a really wet B year, like we had in Australia this year, you find the rust everywhere. Literally, if you go through the forest, you find them in all kinds of plants and also on just your meadows. It's very exciting to be a rust researcher. All right, so uh, the rust is a fungal order of the most plant pathogens, uh, roughly 8,000 scrapped. The obligate pyotrophs, which means, of course, you can't culture them except on the plant itself, uh, even though in the 80s and 70s people try to culture them, but it just turned weird. Uh, they are Dicaryotic, so it means they have two nuclei in the stage which causes pandemics. They're important for agriculture because you probably already had some bread or some coffee, maybe you had some soy, or maybe some barley, maybe you already have beer, or you're gonna have a beer later. So it really uh, rust infects all kinds of plants and has an impact on all of those production settings. Really. Here, except for rice, which is like a, a peculiar thing, um, 
a theory about anyway. So important for uh, ecosystems, especially in New Zealand, Australia, also is myrtle rust. So we have myrtle rust invasion over the last couple of years, which really threatened some of the myrtle say, which is a pretty big group in Australia and in New Zealand, uh, which builds basic ecosystem. So we try and research this and also stop this or manage it basically. So this is like leaf rust, but you've probably seen pictures of this. And that's a myrtle rust uh, in new, uh, which just infects some of the myrtle same. All right, so let's talk a little bit about myrtle rust first. So myrtle rust is like uh, Australopithecus senior CDI. Um, it has been in an incursion in Australia for quite a long time. And it's really pushing some of the trees here to the extinction. So some of the na native guava or some of the paper parks that we have, which are also really culturally important to indigenous people um, in indigenous forests. Um, are really are threatened by those. And so that's very basic study this, uh, both from on the plant side, which I'm not going to touch on, so we do sequence genomes and try to identify uh, markers for uh, rust resistant. But of course, we focus more on the plant pathogen side. And we'll present some of this today. All right, so myrtle rust uh, by really great uh, work by Carnegie and Peck, the uh, true heroes of the forest uh, world here, I would say. Very nice people, and also Peck works a lot of indigenous people very well, which is really nice to see. The first was found in Guava in Brazil, like really a long time ago, in the 19, uh, 1880s. It has a very broad host range um, for rust. But you can discuss it actually, probably most rust are fairly broad, um, potentially, just to be how we look for in agriculture, didn't show this to us. Then this is Myrtle Rust, an invasive pathogen in most ecosystem you see. It kind of moved across um, uh, Pacific, basically, towards us, us, Jamaica, Brazil, Mexico, and then in somehow got to Hawaii, Australia, also South Africa detected, and then New Zealand most recently. So it kind of how it traveled in Australia, the hypothesis came out of infected blocks. Uh, New Zealand, maybe uh, by wind or by travelers. So it's fairly widespread. See, all right. So if you know a little bit of Australia, it's like how Australia looks like. We have Tasmania and the islands at the bottom. Um, it's a lovely place, especially for a better government. Um, so here, so you see where you can actually find myrtle rust. Myrtle rust is really uh, mostly found on the East Coast. It has been not found on the West Coast just yet. So, and just mostly at coastal region because it needs this humidity and also basically that's where the, uh, most of the myrtle say have uh, grown basically. But we have not found it in the ACT, which is like here where I am in the Australian Capital Territory in Canberra, uh, because it basically is uh, too cold and not humid enough. What's of course also very important in the Australian landscape is that myrtle rust really infects the regrowth. So as you might have known, we had a couple of fires, big, big fires uh, in 2020, 19, just before the pandemic. We had this like basic natural disaster and a lot of the regrowth now gets infected and some trees really struggle to sprout because they have the pericarpic sprouting, which means these trees sprout from the trunk out uh, in these new saplings from the uh, trunk they just get infected and die. So there is a real problem. All right. So the V-Trust, you probably hear about V-Trust too, a slight reduction here. So we work mostly with your because it's the biggest disease in Australia for weeds in general. Um, there's maybe a little bit of like leaf rust for the other rest. And like, a, there's not really stem rust. We don't really have a stem rust problem in Australia. Um, so, and if you know, if you have a really infected uh, wheat field, you have lots of spores and even like really need clouds, so billions of spores produced. So together, if you count the wheat rust together, basically, which is leaf rust, stripe rust, and stem rust, together, they have the biggest problem of, of wheat globally, according to the study published in Nature Ecology and Evolution a couple of years ago. Uh, leaf rust is kind of 
the rust, which is kind of everywhere and does a little bit everywhere, but it's not leading to this big epidemic. But while uh, recent occurrences of striped rust really drove epidemics globally, and even since then, there's a new strain around character of Morgan Hofmuller, uh, mostly in Sashi Dali and others, which is really a big problem globally. Uh, potentially a hybridization, but I mean, hybridization is a very contested topic in the rest and very, very difficult to show. And I think it has been not conclusively shown so far. I think we were wrong, basically. So the impacts are unequal disputed, so the rapid evolution during monoculture and the long distance dispersal via wind and trade. So slight introduction to the immune system because it will need this a little later. So the classic dots and Redchen from Nature Genetics a long time ago. So you have basically a detection system of pathogen in the plasma membrane, which often receptor like kinases where I started my career really. Um, and then you have these major resistant loci, which are mostly by encoded by MBSLR, which recognize the so-called effectors which are secreted by the historia into the cytoplasm and then recognized there in the case of fungi. Now, of course, we also have adult plant resistant or similar like minor disease resistant traits, uh, which are mostly probably related to either hormone signaling or transport of chemicals and physiology. In the gene for gene hypothesis, of course, you have the key lock principle that you have like a resistance gene. If you have the right vector, you are uh, uh, resistant. And if you don't have the right resist, uh, receptor, you really can't recognize specific effectors and you become susceptible uh, to the rest in case of wheat and wheat trusts. So, this perspective I want to give a little bit here, which is important, maybe more so for the Australian concept because we're in an island. A very big island, but we're an island, uh, similar to New Zealand. The biosecurity in keeping these pathogens out is really important for our economy because it allows a trade access and all. And it's also really important for our environment because we don't want these pathogens destroying our environment, basically, like model risk. So actually detecting those is very important. So the question if a pathogen is present is one, then what lineage of a pathogen is present is another one. So do we have a new incursion of model loss? So it's all the same all the time. And then, of course, what we're really interested in agriculture, especially, is like what is the effector arsenal and which of these effectors recognized and what kind of allele of an effector has a specific strain. So, can we predict which wheat variety can be infected by a specific uh, uh, rust uh, strain or isolate, uh, giving its effector profile or ABR profile? But these are basically the big questions for biosecurity or also general uh, pathology. And so it's a really bad genomic country. So of course, you can detect pathogens with uh, like yes or no, uh, with genomics really nice, and you know, other methods like mass spectrometry as well. But genomics is really good because it's kind of a universal approach. Then what kind of lineage is present, what kind of genotype is present? Of course, you need genomics. You can't do it really otherwise. Very, very difficult. And then, of course, with arsenal effectors, again, you need genomic. But genomic really underpins, I think, actual fine grained biosecurity and also plant pathology responses uh, in the 21st century. I think it's like it will be an integral part in the diagnosis at these different levels. Okay, so if you look at this, really, if you ask what lineage is there and what gen of genotype is there, Really, you're looking for neutral loci. You don't want to look really anything under selection. You want to simply sample uh, random loci, build a phylogenetic tree because it's mostly the assumption of phylogenetic trees um, that you look at neutral loci. And then um, you can make inferences how things are related. And then, in, whereas in effectors, you're really uh, mostly interested in specific loci and these below loci, loci are selected. So they're not really good loci actually to build traits. Okay. So for the lineage, you really want to find a genetic inference and then you want to find genome uh, basically. And then of course, really to make this uh, actionable item, you need an integrated data management platform and analysis. 
And again, that's something we're working towards in Australia with many, many partners, really to get this integrative uh, database together where people share the data and we can integrate the data uh, and then make inferences and actionable items performance out of this. That's kind of our roadmap for the next five to 10 years with various uh, agricultural departments around the country. Um, yeah. Okay, so I will tell you a little bit two stories now for the rest of the talk um, after setting the scene. So gonna talk about the striper as the continuous performance from what's really side, which we generated several genomes recently. Uh, and then I will tell you a little bit of a, uh, about a model rest, also within Epithidii. Again, we published recently the biggest genome ever published for a fungal um, pathogen. We are also working on a, a new version of the genome to improve it further. But we already made some really cool like genomic insights. I think I wanted to share this with you today. All right, so let's get going. With this. The retrust again, we have this use boom and bust cycles because of the flaws uh, uh, gene for gene hypothesis. So with stripe rust is, when most people look at it as really in the street dichroic stage in wheat, because in most areas on the planet, uh, it's dichroic, so it has two nuclei. There's five spore uh, stages and there's a sexual cycle geographically restricted, which is very important. So this is really mostly happening. This is a sexual cycle where you still see telescope production in Western countries, but we never really so far in the environment have observed infection of Barbary and the completion of the life cycle within um, Western wheat growing areas or also in South Africa or even in Africa, South America and Africa. So this is really restricted to the um, Himalayan region and Sashi Dali does amazing work there and we hope we can really support, support him uh, and work with him the more with our recent grant we're trying to get there. Because I think that's really a treasure trove and so important to study the source population of the Himalayan region. Right. So uh, when I started this a couple of years ago now, um, maybe seven years, so the rust genomes were really a mess <clears throat> basically. Um, both from rust and for, stem, uh, for stripe rust. At the time, stripe rust was uh, fragmented in 30,000 contexts. And I think for myrtle rust, there was less context or similar context, but they estimated the genome size to 100 megabases, but it's still not as big. So, Rumina short sequence is just not the right approach, at least not for generating genomes. Maybe resequence is fine to a certain degree, but that's really um, a problem with the rest uh, genomes at the time. What we then published several papers around is this kind of partial phased assemblies um, where you have some of those alternative haplotypes present in phase, but you might still have some phase swaps, basically, and it's still like broken up. So it's about the low hundreds, and we'll mostly talk about this today. And of course, um, most recently, uh, we also published in nature to, uh, communication with others plus also for stripe rust alone, together uh, recently MPMI, <coughs> some complete genomes and close to complete genomes, which are complete phase. And so this is basically <coughs> the current standard, <coughs> which combines long read sequencing with high C. And this uh, high C is really what we pioneered here, here at ANU, and then others in Cyro adopted later on. But it's very exciting to see that the community really lives up to this and really took all of us on board. And I'm very excited to see how others take this technology and make exciting uh, biological inferences. All right. So stripe rest is, uh, really has these two uh, high, uh, separated, geographically separated uh, infection cycles to some degree. So really in, uh, in the west meat growing area, areas, it's mostly asexual, it's global, it's a low genetic diversity within each lineage. And then on Barbary and the Himalayan region, we have a high genetic diversity. Uh, of course, you also infect wheat, but it's like in each growing cycle, a growing season, you replace populations one after another. And again, Sajid Ali showed it really, really well with a couple of studies. 
So what is the effect of long-term asexual versus sexual reproduction on human evolution? That's a question we asked in a couple of studies recently within this dry breast. Um, so if we look at a recent asexual isolate with DK0911, and then we looked at long-term long -term asexual isolate, which we in blue, which is PST104. All right. So what, was the, what were the inferences? Just a quick summary is that we have an expansion of genome size with long-term asexual isolates, which is interesting. So this is likely related, at least in part, to the having more transposable elements. And you also have an effect of uh, higher heterozygosity in the long-term asexual isolate versus uh, recent, sexual, uh, recent sexual isolate. So the hypothesis here is that the uh, Müller's ratchet is based idea that you have with your long-term asexual uh, reproduction, you, accumulate, you tend to accumulate mutation continuously, and these mutation um, can't be purged because you don't have any recombination going on. And so you have more and more this, uh, SNPs with single nuclear polymorphism and all the larger structural variation between those because potentially because of transposable element movement. So that was our hypothesis and our observation there. Uh, so that was pretty uh, interesting. I'll show you a little bit of the data. The other thing which we also show, showed is that we have a telomere shortening. Telomeres and fungi are already really, really short, but uh, they got even shorter in the long term asexual class. So um, the TE con contribution to the genome size is basically they have the same age, so TE family identity. Uh, it's kind of a proxy for TEH. So the, you see that both BSC 104E and TK911 both have the same profile here. And then when you see when you have the, when did the different strains accumulate difference in the amount of the elements, it's that you had really a burst here at this 85% uh, identity. So at this point in time, if you want to look at the time, you had a burst or you you either had a burst or more likely you had a retainment of these TEs uh, in psd one for e because this has been, this, if you would date this, it would be a couple million years ago. And I don't think that these isolates are set apart that much. And then you can also look what kind of families are really enriched in this. And you see that the gypsies uh, are really um, enriched in uh, psd one for e is our some of the class two um, enzyme, uh, which are DNA transport and so forth. The several families specifically in which basically, um, which have likely have been retained in PSC 103 and then have been purged into the 11 to, to sexual recombination. That's my hypothesis. Right. So now we look at the large genetic variation. So of course you can also incorporate the facing here at the time of this, because we had noisy long reads, I'm not going to go into detail here, but the phasing was 90% here and only 60%. So you had more of the genome collapse, which indicates you have less heterozygosity, which we also showed with these other measures and how you can see this as well. So here you have these different categories of insertion, deletions, repeats, and tandem constructions. And so there's two big uh, take home messages basically is that small nucleotides polymorphism really contribute very little to the variation between the genomes. It's really these larger variations which uh, contribute the variation between the haplotypes, between the two nuclei, we really like to think about it, I like guess. And in pc one of these, as the older one, you have much more of those. So you have much more space, much more genome which is rearranged in one of four E with T K and another. Right. So what are we current working on? Unfortunately, I hoped I could present something on this, but we just didn't right get there. So we're really looking currently into trying to identify some ABR, we have some good candidates, and we're also working on some positive protoplast readouts. So not on cell deaths, but actually on activation. So we don't really want to rely on cell deaths because I don't think it's really sensitive enough for some of the things we want to do. So we invested quite a lot of time to develop a system where we don't rely on cell deaths, but uh, on other transcriptional readouts, which will give you a positive signal so you can actually select for it. 
way, in a positive way, which is not possible with cell death. And we just finishing establishing a system, but I hope we could have done it, but COVID and all of the other problems delayed, of course. And then the question which we really would like to address here is what are the different host infection mechanism? So also compare strep breast and Barbary, what are the genetic requirements that really become epidemic on wheat? Means maybe comparing some of the population in the Himalayan region versus population in Western wheat growing areas. Are there any genetic differences in common, uh, which makes the wheat pathogens, a wheat pathogen, in, uh, infect large, uh, large acreages? And then, of course, uh, what are the genomic consequences of infecting different hosts in wheat, which kind of ABRs to there? And this is all work in progress coming So, like a quick switch to Myrtle Rust. So, Myrtle Rust is the biggest fungal genome um, uh, sequence assembled so far. And it was a good effort at the time. We have a new version out, which is definitely better. Uh, at the time, it was really, really challenging because of some uh, genome characteristics that I will show you. Now, but I think it was a milestone, and I think what also was really important about this, actually having a genome allowed us to develop probes to detect myrtle rust in air samples, in spores sample from the air, which is very important because then you can track actually the movement of these pathogens in the air, maybe even before they cause epidemics. And so that was very important to have a genome to share this genome's uh, information with others openly beforehand in, within Australia and outside Australia, and really helps them to develop these probes to be able to detect pathogen spores from air samples. So I think it was a, it was very important for us, even so it was right. So why is it difficult to assemble Myrtle Rust? Because you have like a huge expansion of uh, <laughs> the spotal elements. So the genome is 90% chipsy elements, so it's really mostly repeats. And it also, the other problem is it has really this huge expansion of a specific class at a specific time. So really one of those families makes up a significant amount, which is basically a family around here, which you can see here is one of the class L LTR, Chipsy elements, like long term repeats, uh, Chipsies, um, which really led to this expansion here. And because it's also still fairly, it's still fairly similar to each other, especially compared to the error rate of the reads at the time, which is around 85%. So it was really difficult to resolve some of these genomes because the uh, reads weren't long enough to span that. And um, it was just too similar, really. So there was a massive expansion of this one class which really contributes to a genome expansion at one specific point of time. There's a most recent expansion is one to uh, five million years ago, it's what we dated it. What it costs, we don't know, but I will come back to this in a second. So another really interesting observation of Myrtle Rust really was of the genome, is that you have a really AT rich region. So you have a high AT content compared to uh, uh, Strapras fungus, Pixinia Strapomus, Tritici. And this was really unusual at the time um, to find something like this. But most recently, we actually sequenced another arrest, which is Buxinia controlina with uh, people at CSIRO at the biosecurity section on CSIRO, um, given Hunter, because they had been long working on Buxinia controlina, and it just really helped them do the genome analysis. And what they, what we found in this other rust fungus, we found something very similar. So we found another rust fungus, which has a very similar profile um, of um, AT richness. And we have some hints, but maybe causing this. And it, it might be actually we're linked to sexual reproduction with my hypothesis. I don't have anything like this. And why I think this is because uh, Celopec CDI does have sexual cycles quite a bit, I think. And similar, Buxinia probably also have quite some sexual, often sexual cycles compared to some of the weed rests, which uh, have other reproduction mechanisms too, maybe more long term. And because this high AT rich region in other genomes and the ascomyosis is related basically to rip, rip, repeat introduced point mutations, which is related to the sexual cycle. Anyway, that's my hypothesis, no proof of that. All right, so when we then looked at the GC content of transposable elements, 
um, and we overlay this with age. So again, you can use identity, percentage identity as a measure of age in the sense the more you look alike, the more younger you are because your independent copies couldn't uh, accumulate mutations. And so then we overlay this with GC content. So basically, if you go back in time, so you go from here to this time, so we go from most recent T's, youngest T's to older T's, what you see is the older you get, the less GC you have, the more AT you have. And this is a, what's intriguing, I mean, which suggests that over time, you accumulate mutations, but preferentially mutations, which have an a, uh, AT. And consistently with this um, is that we also find a depletion of GPC sites. The GPC sites are important for methylation. And again, over time, we see a depletion of GPC sites in older teeth. Again, an indication for a specific mechanism that involves methylation uh, in as a conversion of uh, cytosines to um, thiamines, which is a very classic uh, mutation signature, uh, which is mediated by methylation. And in the meantime, after the study, we helped people at uh, Thyra again to actually look at something very similar in uh, stem rust. So we looked at stem rust in methylation and so on. And we showed there is methylation in the rust franchise. That's the work we've done here uh, at ANU contributing to papers. Uh, both in planta and in uh, the spores. And there is methylation in rust fungi and it's quite dominant. We haven't shown this in um, myrtle rust yet, but all the machinery is there. So basically what we think is that methylation of these TEs led initial desilenting and then to hyper um, uh, mutability, specifically at CPG sites uh, because they're hypermutatal and lead to a TG transversion from a pipe scene to TG transversion, which is very well studied. And my hypothesis on top of this is that it might be related to how often you have sex, basically, or how often you go to sex. Anyway, there's just an hypothesis. We have many um, uh, proof of this, but we were uh, working on a new version of the Myrtle Rust genome, which is completely phased, which would be then. We already have chromosomes, which is the biggest uh, rust genome in chromosomes, and we're currently doing the phasing for this, and then will be the biggest uh, rust genome um, complete phase with really interesting features in the genome. All right, so what's next? So we're trying to develop lineage specific markers again, so we can sample spores from the air. So can we detect novel incursions of myrtle rust um, by sequencing from our spore samples? We are working on annotating multiple, actually around 50 MRDSA genomes for resistance genes and see if there are specific families which haven't been described in there. And market development is also something, but that's a little further off. We potentially try to develop some markers uh, for a specific resistance flow sign, but that's a little further off. Really. Oh, really? So that's where the state of the art was um, most recently. That we have this partial phase uh, assemblies. I showed you some of those, uh, what we inferred from those. I think we learned quite a lot. And that is like the interesting stuff. While we have some phase assemblies so far, there's not that much haplotype uh, comparison yet published. I mean, we have PGT210, which had some work done with Jana Sperschneider, which went back to Thyro after working with us for some time. So that was interesting, especially overlaying with centromeres and um, with methylation IC. So that was really nice work. We could all contribute. It was good for the community. But really, afterwards, we haven't really looked, uh, explored this interhaplotype uh, diversity. Of course, these problems with these initial assemblies, you still have phase swaps. This wasn't chromosome level, and it's not nucleus assigned. And really, with the work we've done in ANU, with Jana, who we went back to uh, Cyronam, is that we we established a day to use the technology with IC, and then Jana was really instrumental to generate these um, complete genome assemblies, um, and many others have done this in the meantime, where basically everything goes right now, you need to you have the chromosome, but high c is not simple. I mean, it is a challenging technology to get working on different plant tissues and fungal tissues. 
but really we're at the stage where we are in the rust genome biology field. It's really complete chromosomes, which is very, very exciting, I think. You can ask lots of questions. This is a paper from published, part of a paper published by Jana again, PMC biology, I think got the attribution of biology for that. Um, that was really good. Um, you see all these uh, centromeres interacting here, stuff like this, it looks really, really nice, nicely assembled, very well done. Happy to contribute to high C data for this. And because it really, and now enables the community working together, really going through structural variation, allele variation, and asking for single copy genes. So our ABRs all heterozygous, at least the ABRs which could easily lost, is to start with, lost, probably yes. Our ABRs which are more stable as a homozygous, probably yes, at least in Sabitras. Then we can really relate genome architecture with lifestyle, life stage, and host habitation. So are the certain features which are linked to sexual reproduction in the rust. I think I had named some hypotheses here. It's a very exciting time. Then you can compare the long term with asexual reproduction versus sexual reproduction. Of course, really complete genomes are really good for blueprint for cloning ABRs, and we are working on this. It's, I think for stripers, it's very hard uh, because we don't really have the best collection. And it is really hard to work with stripers from a single postal isolate and purification and so on. I think the sleeve rest in uh, stripers is very easier because you have some nice postals, but in stripers, you have these really small um, postals and they're all intertwingled. And uh, it's, it's amazing what people actually can do to clean up these strains and make them really uh, isogenic. It's a, it's a lot, a lot of work, and we should never forget that that really always is people who can do that, and the real pathologist, which will enable our work of the of the uh, genomics. So yeah, all right. Of course, this we hope goes all all better to resistant breeding, durability, and then pathogen population monitoring. Again, um, yeah, and Sanders with the Mabel pipeline things shows that it's possible. I think COVID also shows that it's really, really possible. And I think you're not too far away if you work together um, as a community to really be able to track this globally uh, in a reasonable manner, maybe also share the data uh, globally. But of course, there's lots of issues uh, data sharing, going by security threats and legal perspective too. Anyway, so from our bigger point, I hope you get a lot of the feelings that we Hopefully, it could illustrate that we work around. Of course, we work in pattern genomes and um, try to want to identify effect, but it has an end goal. It has an end goal to then lead to pathogen population monitoring, uh, have tools to maybe clone more R genes, and really have these actual items which can really inform agriculture in the future or for natural environment, monitor invasive species, basically, like farm murderers is for us better and also take novel incursions better because we only can do it with genomic novels. This is very important. But of course, we can't do everything ourselves. So we really have to work with stakeholders and people who can do stuff better than us, basically. So thank you for that. Um, this is basically a long list of thank yous. Um, maybe what we should pick out here. I mean, Myrtle Rest, Robert Parker was actually really good uh, working with him for some couple years on this topic. Also with Perry De Tobias, which I think I forgot here to mention, but, but she's an excellent collaborator on the Myrtle Rest story. Um, great hands, great mind, really for Perry. Uh, thanks for that. We also work with people in um, New Zealand on these topics uh, and also with state government organizations uh, to really try to tackle this. We do some odd plant genomics. I haven't done this for a while, but um, we still do that. Um, and then the Vitras, really, these were, uh, Diana moved to Syrah now. These are previously collaborators, which we don't collaborate anymore, but Sam is really uh, excellent uh, in Syrah, and I'm wishing best of luck, really. Then we work a lot with Morgan Hoffman and our house, Anna Marie. Which is great, and we also have uh, Sashid, which I unfortunately also forgot the apologies, slightly older slide actually. This thing acknowledgement slide, so just Sheet Ali, of course, very, very important in the strippers field, it does very much fundamental work. That's so a shout out to him. And we do work with pathogenomics and um, multiple players here, 
and the latest uh, collaboration section of him on the, on the update to slide. Okay, so I rambled on a little bit. Apologies for that. Without any feedback, that's always a little difficult from a black screen. Um, basically, I think we have to do this together. We shouldn't really uh, compete so much, uh, much about some of these things. Um, yeah, I think we should lift the board together and I think we get much further to this. Um, so if you have any questions about these topics, uh, please get in touch. Uh, and again, thank Fukuchan for inviting me and sorry, I couldn't get up at uh, 4.30 in the morning. I just didn't have any to speak. Thank you. And I try to switch this off now. Thanks. Thank you, Nico. Uh, I will thank uh, um, Benjamin uh, in an email or in a phone call. Uh, if you have any questions for Benjamin, please feel free to send him an email. And because we are already running late without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our last but not the least uh, uh, speaker of uh, this workshop, Professor Herbans Briana. Um, he received his PhD from uh, University of Sydney Plant Breeding Institute and uh, for more than 25 years he's working for the same institution as a weed geneticist and he is very well recognized and respected for his work on weed rust and weed genetics and his group along with his colleagues is one of the groups uh, uh, who are known for mapping uh, um, many genes and QTLs for wheat rust uh, uh, resistance. Uh, Herbans, if I missed anything, anything important for your introduction, please feel free to cover that and uh, you can start sharing your screen and uh, start your presentation. Sorry, I did something wrong. Just a second. Can you see it, Gurjan? No, we can't see it. We saw it. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, let me just then go back. Uh, yeah, okay, I will share it again. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for your kind words. And uh, I think I don't know how to get to this. Let me just sort out one issue here. Yeah, now it's good. Uh, is this your mm -hmm. first slide? I think. Yes, I will just go. Okay, yeah. sure. Yes. So, yeah, no, nothing missed out. You rather gave me a little bit of too much uh, respect. Thank you very much for that. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And it's my morning. So I start with the photo of uh, William Ferrer, who was our pioneer plant breeder, wheat breeder, I would say. And uh, that $2 note is not in circulation. Now we have coins, but that has become a history. You can see wheat heads and the wheat breeder on a note. And then I was reading literature and I saw Stegman's write up in which he said plant disease epidemics, outbreaks of insect pests, bad weather. And more importantly, I think human ignorance are the greatest obstacles to assured 
food supply for the people of the world. It just sums it all for plant pathologists, weed breeders, that what we have to do, how can we achieve? <clears throat> so majority of my career has been funded by Green Research and Development Corporation and uh, had a few projects with Australian Center for International Agriculture Research. Why do we discover resistance sources? to save our crops from epidemics, to save our environment from chemicals, and to achieve food security. Where do we get the new sources? We can have collections, we can have germplasm as for this. I shown some of his research on the current varieties. And there's endless material which we can work on. And I chose to work on Budkin's collection, which was collected by an English botanist, Arthur Budkin's in 1920s, from 33 different locations around the globe. You can see how well spread. Why did I choose it? Because they, were tall and we have not possibly put RXT genes in every tall weed. So we have really uh, made the genetic base of our cultivated variety much narrower. And my hypothesis was that if we go back to long, tall weeds, we may have a lot of genetic variation left in those. So you can see how this pie has how many different places. And um, so it's really a true genetic variation collected at that time and probably still a very relevant for not only rust, but many other traits. Now, where do we start? First of all, we got this collection. Then we look at initial thing starts with phenomics. We have to screen it. We have to know what varieties are resistant. Then we go sideways. We have to do genome-wide association or whatever technology you can think of. It changes almost every six months. And those genomic approaches are applied in a different kind of manner, whatever, depending upon your budget. And eventually, once you describe those sources, then you have to take them in the breeding material and eventually it becomes a cultivar one day. So it's basically uh, the way I describe the sort of our program, which is called Australian Serial Rust Control Program. We work from right from here to here. We work with breeders. And it's a very well coordinated lab to land process. Now, when we look at resistance, um, I think Dr. Chen from USA summed it up rather than saying seedling vertical or whatever. Uh, the major gene resistance has all stage resistance, which I often call it as an army because it really gives you full protection when you have so many such a strength there. Then adult plant resistance, which does not express well in the seedling stages, but as the plant matures, expression happens, but a, a single gene will not give you enough protection. You have to have pyramids. You have to have three or four genes to get commercially acceptable level. And that's why I call as Air Force. But for durable resistance, you need army to be covered by Air Force, which means we need to deploy combinations of ASR and APRs, which is, if I have seen in literature, I've seen in a lot of talks, people always say, let's do APR, let's do APR. But I have been 
continuously saying that if without army your air force is nothing without air force your army is nothing so you have to have both that means you can actually have an alternative if a pathogen attacks you or if the enemy attacks you so it's basically breeding for disease resistance is pretty much like army of a country so our testing of the material that Botkin's collection we have done it many places in India at our own place at Coverty we have done Washington State and worked with Canadians your fellow colleagues and I remember when we have to describe one of the so-called allele of wire 10 I worked with the, the Lethray Center and Simit Akada more the marriers we can't achieve tangible outcomes working alone. Once you're working together as an international community, it's much more quick, important, and sharing kind of experience. So then even in the field, if you look at it, this is the center in India, called in the Nilgiri Hills and uh, this is our place and uh, you can see kenya ethiopia now ug99 plus sr24 here is not a that 24 virulence is not as strong as the virulence of our 24 in race 48 because ug99 has a unique a virulence for some of the defeated genes like SRH, SR9H, SR28, and 15 is also defeated, and uh, it's good on that too. So basically, once we combine here, 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 and then these are some places in Pakistan, my colleagues are there, and Ethiopia, I worked with these guys for quite a few years on Durham's. Once we have the mix of full data, we can achieve a lot more rather than just doing it only here. Uh, so that's what I wanted to convey from this slide that it's better to get you real tested because then you know, but resistance prevails all over and you can narrow your candidates for genetic analysis. So when we... We started working on Watkins collection in 2005. And this is three years data I'm showing that we had variation more like one to nine scale for striplast. We have done the same for stem and leaf. So up to here, usually can be a mix of major genes. And here, it could be a combination of some APRs, but from here onwards, this is a sort of overlapping class, but from here onwards, it's, it's for APR. So you can see that even eight may have one, one APR, and seven may have one, and six may have one. Once you combine one, 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 you can even bring it down to somewhere here. So it's basically, you have to put those APRs together, but if you look at the major genes, only one or two will give do the job for you. But certainly, it will be good to keep two rather than one. So then once we have identified candidates there, we did seedling tests, and then we made populations across F3s, eventually all stage, if it comes easy, monogenic piece of cake, digenic, you have to isolate genes, and when you go the adult plant resistance way, it's much more rigorous, but you have to work more, much harder in the field and uh, find, isolate those minor genes or QTLs in, for your detailed mapping. So basically mapping uh, genetics is then followed by whatever like if you have more money, you can do whole genome genotyping. If you have less, 
people do bulk segregant analysis or selective genotyping in which they don't bulk it but they take 20 odd you know extremes and on both sides is yeast tendon susceptible and eventually you develop markers like this and i think these are more popular snips are more popular now and this is an example of a casp marker assay so this process we follow in a very some people follow in a bun manner other follow other manner but this is an overall short which i have put together uh, as a simple way of communicating the way we design our experiments so snip markers you can see they are the markers of choice uh, in the 21st century so we have a high throughput genotyping systems and genomes are sequenced and we can get these sort of base pair variations or single nucleotide polymorphism polymorphism variations and now much more quickly than 15 years ago now we can actually think of looking at a marker for a gene in a much shorter period than it used to be uh, 10 years ago so we have technological advances had really developed to the level that we are making a lot more progress and a lot more genes have been named. I think in the last 15 years, almost more than 50% rust resistance genes have been named in stripe rust. And so that is because the technology is much faster. We are using these SNP kind of systems rather than the cytogenetic techniques which used to take a lot of time and a lot of specialized skill. So out of the Vatican collection, as a, we actually mapped uh, the wire 47 was first. And interestingly, LR52 was named by the Canadian friends from Winnipeg. And that work was started by Peter Dick. And then I think eventually Colin Hewitt is the one who named it. Uh, and Interestingly, we did not compare, but we picked up the same line for genetic analysis. And the first hit went on to chromosome 5BS where LR52 was located. And then once uh, we were really disheartened and then we thought, let's check it for stripe rust. And we found that wire 47 was linked with uh, LR52. So, that was accidental, but it was quite enjoyable that our population did not go wasted. So then we had another line which carried two genes. One of them was YR51. The other one was YR57. So we have to separate those and you can say YR57 gives you very strong reaction. And it was mapped on 3VS. Whereas this was mapped on 4AL, this is intermediate type, but possibly a more durable kind, this one is broken down already. Similarly, you know, we have gone quite a few, you know, six or seven genes for stripe rust, and there are more we are still working on, on the adult plant resistance gene discovery from the Watkins collection. And we do work on modern germplasm as well, as and when we identify a candidate uh, for genetic analysis from our varieties. For example, by 75, we worked on uh, from an Australian variety. So then once we have the marker, you can see the important thing is that if we leave it here, that we have susceptible and resistant comparison, it doesn't help the breeder. And once you validate those markers, for example, this is SSR where you don't have this SNP kind of assays, and we have SNP, both alternatives we have. And you can see that testing on so many varieties which, which were 
in cultivation in Australia at that time. We have shown that it will work in all those backgrounds. And there are few varieties from India because that was this work was part of uh, Mandeep Randava's work who did PhD with us. So we can show, we can validate the uh, very usefulness of this mark, these markers for selection of YR57. This is an example. And whatever gene we name or we characterize, we actually or we find a markers for, we try to validate them. Much bigger panel now. We have about 90 odd varieties, and sometimes even more than that. We, we validate them on those so that breeders can easily identify the polymorphisms. Uh, this is just an example of a SNP. Uh, you know, once you are doing validation and susceptibles can go one way or one way or the other, you can differentiate the pools very clearly. And if something is heterozygous can come in the middle. So then, we do a bit of fine mapping. Uh, this is a target which we are addressing at the moment. And that's where we have Canadian connection as well because LR52 was worked upon our Canadian colleagues first. And we are pretty close to cloning it um, because we have joined ha hands with the John Inner Center and which have Chinese collaboration. So we have now good cloning uh, person. We have good bioinformatic person and we have plant breeders part of the team. So basically we are pretty close. We have actually oh, co-segregating markets with this, these two genes. And now we have candidate genes, which we will be looking at how to so to prove that they are certainly the candidates through uh, putting them into you know, doing some transformation kind of experiments or silencing, uh, which if it, if you're lucky works quickly, but if you're not, it may take time. So let's see whether we are lucky or unlucky, but we are pretty close to this. And my feeling is that this little thing may well be a interstitial segment from a tetraploid. That's why we are comparing Zeviton and Surero uh, and Chinese spring together to see if we can differentiate whether this bit belongs to one of these and it's different than Chinese spring. And we have previous uh, like Sam Perrion and who was my student as well, but now he's a cloning guru. So he's part of this team and uh, he cloned SR33 first Temrust together. At the same time, George Dukowski cloned SR35. Those two papers we had pretty much uh, head to head in science in 2013. And then on the APR side, we have, earlier we had QDL on 5BL, but now we found one on 5BL. And this one we feel, we have found it in four different populations. And in one, one or two populations, we could not compare leaf rust, but in two populations, it shows that it's a pleiotropic. Stem rust we can't compare in the background, but leaf rust and stripe rust is actually uh, conditioned by this QTL. And similarly, we have found recently named YR80, which is uh, an adult plant resistance gene on chromosome 3B. And it was present in a, a land race, Barkins land race. And eventually we, our colleagues in CSIR of Mikhailov and Co, they were working on durums. We find that this gene is present in likely to be this gene, and present in durums as well. 
So now, once we have found those genes, this is an example. You can change the names of the varieties and change the names of the genes. This is what Mandeep did during his PhD. We pick, we pick up varieties, put those genes in, but at the same time, we keep these background genes also. And then that material is given to breeders. And this is something uh, we call our bread and butter because we provide our breeders in Australia material almost every second year or third year with uh, fortified cultivars. The cultivars fortified with new genes. So we have whatever we try to characterize, we cross in, see if these are old varieties, but we now we have different names. Uh, we, we, collect, we put them in those varieties and by the time we have done uh, mapping and market development, the gene is already present in certain backgrounds for validation uh, of the markers. And breeders have market tagged sources of resistance which they can use in their breeding program. So the main thing which I would like to conclude is that discovery and characterization deployment is a journey, it's not a destination. We have to continuously do it. And if we think we, are, we have done, we have achieved durable resistance, I think it's probably a dream not coming true. Good example is breakdown of SR31 with Juli 99. I think we thought that SR31 has given us protection and some people still call it a durable gene, in, uh, but you never know when the pathogen succeeds. And the other thing is that working together with other disciplines, it can fast track your discovery. It can fast track, it can make you think better. So it's always good to working with collaboratively with different disciplined people, rather than doing it just on your own. If you are a geneticist, work with a pathologist, molecular geneticist, breeder, uh, don't, don't try to do all those things yourself. And more importantly, don't leave your discovery and publications, take it from lab to the land. So it's, these are the three points which I always emphasize to my collaborators to my students and I practice it. So here is the team which has done the work. You can see that we have quite a few, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Uganda, Australia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and uh, Bhutan, India again. That's my colleague uh, who does all the, I'm a geneticist pathologist, she's a molecular geneticist. So we work as a team and all these people have been as PhD students and these two are our research support. So with this, thank you very much for your attention. Questions, please. Thank you so much, Harban. It, it was great to have this talk uh, in the end because it just doesn't summarize your work, but also summarize our uh, you know, a uh, special issue uh, that was focused around uh, resistance breeding and rust pathology. So with that, uh, I would welcome questions from the audience. I have one question, uh, Harbans. Do yeah. we do we have any commercial cultivar that carries uh, SR33? Yes, we have one in Australia. But okay, but I don't think that gene is uh, uh, deployed uh, extensively in breeding, right? Yeah, it is a intermediate kind of resistance. And the other thing is that uh, uh, if, if we look at the breeder, uh, breeding programs around the world. Uh, breeders prefer linkages, right? SR24, LR24 dominated, SR38, YR17 dominated, SR31, 
LR26. So those combinations actually did not leave enough room for some of the single genes to be popular. And uh, we had actually a backrest drive variety uh, with SR33 and SR45. They are on both on Bundy S uh, from Toshii. And but they're very niche market kind of varieties, soft noodles, uh, or I think one of them is biscuit type. Uh, but yeah, overall, uh, despite backrossing in in quite a few backgrounds by my predecessor as well, it did not really see the light of the day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? If none, then I would like to thank all the speakers and her buns for uh, taking time to uh, present your work. And uh, thanks everyone. And before I let all of you go, I want to uh, remind you that there is an other, there is a, a Canadian National, uh, Canadian Phytopathological Society's national meeting coming up. And the registration deadline is June 15th. If you haven't registered, it's an opportunity for you to um, register and learn more about Canadian plant pathology research. Uh, with that, thank you so much to, to all the speakers and to all the attendees. And maybe we, we should say thank you to uh, Wen Chen and Guillaume Bilodeau who took the initiative of organizing this meeting, asking Gertrand and I to organize this meeting too. Yes, I'm sorry I, I missed uh, uh, them, but thanks Nico for covering up. Yes, thanks Ven and Guillermo. Thank Hi, you everyone. Everybody. You're welcome. Bye everybody. Have a great day. Great morning, great evening. <laughs> Enjoy the summer. Bye. I'm not in BC. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, Pascal. Thanks for staying late. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Merci. <laughs> Je dois être fatigué, là. Salut.